like this probably cost these three majors probably cost Australia somewhere in the area of like three four million dollars, depending on how much like these next stickers make the make the teams. Like just from the last major alone, they lost like two million. Best esports odds. VIP program and a variety of bonuses. Fast and easy withdrawals. Bet on every possible CSGO matching tournament. As well as any other esports game. Only on 22Bet. Are you tired of your boring old skins? Head to Trade It and trade them for exciting new ones within seconds. With 24-7 support, massive inventory, free giveaways, and low fees. Trade It is the highest rated trading platform in the market. What are you waiting for? Start trading today for a $5 bonus, only on Trade It. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Counter-Strike fans around the globe, welcome to ASMR done on HLTV.org. Wait, no, wait, that's not our, it's HLTV org. Anyway, let's do the intro again. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Counter-Strike fans around the globe, welcome to another episode of HLTV Confirmed. Our sponsors, our lovely sponsors, the people who go, hey, that show's all right, let's put our bloody brands on it. Trader.gg, if you want to uh, get some skins, head over there, check them out. They got some good stuff. Uh, in the skin variety. And of course, uh, 22 bet. Remember to gamble responsibly. All right, sponsors done. Intro done. Uh, episode number 3,424 uh, in the year 2024 on the 25th of February. Welcome. I hope you're all ready to enjoy yourself. You're ready to have a bit of a conversation. Not you at home. I mean, the people who I um, have a conversation with. And that's going to be Prof, Striker, and Kixon as I guess tonight. But before we get to Kixon, I've got some questions to ask. Prof, are you on another... Uh, like I, I don't know the humanitarian mission to save Swedish Counter Strike at the moment. Are you over there like brokering peace talks and you're working on uh, uh, fixing Swedish CS right now? I mean, after these latest results, I feel like I'm needed here more than ever. Like, and with my experience being from Croatia, where the scene is so dead, like mm. I, I can bring <laughs> all of my experience and uh, knowledge to Sweden to like teach them how how this works now, so they can avoid falling into the same uh, traps as, exactly. uh, as what your part of the world has, has fallen into. Okay, fair enough, understandable. Uh, Striker, I wanted to ask a question because you're you're a man. You know, you're you're softly spoken, but you've got your opinions. But you know. Other than stealing office supplies, I just I wanted to kind of see what's big in Striker's life. So if you won 10 million euros in the lottery tomorrow, what would you do with it? It's so funny that you asked me this because we had this conversation with my girlfriend like literally yesterday. yesterday okay. And I came up with the most boring answer ever. I knew which you is, would. Which is I would just buy like some cool car. That's it. That's all you got. I mean, it's like... I don't have anything that I'm like big missing in my life here. Like, yeah, I would buy an apartment just because like at the moment I'm still paying off mine, whatever. Like I'd be Come boring on, as man. fuck. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Well, I wanted to check. I wanted to check. Now, uh, Kixon joining us here this evening. Kixon, thank you for uh, taking part on, on tonight's show, mate. Uh, how was the travel back home? Uh, yeah, the travel was good. First of all, thanks for the invite. I'm happy to be here. The travel was good. I arrived home a few days ago. Now we're taking some few days off and we're back to the grind. Soon. All right. We'll get in all the serious stuff soon once I kick uh, into the hot seat. But, mate, i got to ask a question, all right? And I might yep. start like a fucking international incident or some shit right now. But listen, man, like where I'm from in Australia, like Europe is this place. Like we know of a couple of countries in Europe and stuff, right? But I need to ask specifically about Macedonia because when uh, Sassanito joined one of the teams that Machine and I were casting about and we're like looking up on the profiles on HLTV and Liquipedia and we're getting all the information, we referred to Sassanito because of Liquipedia as North Macedonian. I'm on the Liquipedia page for you right now, and it says North Macedonian as well. And then some fucking guy on Twitter lit us up. He's like, he's not North Macedonian. He's just fucking Macedonian, you fucking dogs. I don't know exactly what he said. That's kind of what I feel he was saying. But what what's the go? What's Is is North Macedonia a place? Is that the official? What, what's, what's the deal? Uh, it's it's a bit complicated. I don't want to go into details. Okay, it's a political so, thing, but yeah, I can say okay. that 
official it's not Macedonia, but nobody calls it like that. It's just Macedonia for us. Okay, so I am causing the international Macedonians. incident. All yeah. right, all right. So we'll just that's why the guy got upset. Okay, I didn't I didn't mean to, and I don't like ever lingering into politics, but I am an ignorant motherfucker. All right. So I'm glad that we've gotten that out of the way. Now let's get into the hot seat and let's uh, start talking to Kixon about this is his life. We should have a jingle. Anyway, hot seat, let's go. All right, my apologies to anyone I've upset with the initial question to start the show. Uh, we'll pivot away from anything regional. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious because uh, Prof's done the runner show for tonight <laughs> and it says competitive start and regional teams. So maybe we won't be completely avoiding anything regional, but uh, kicks in. You've seen, you know, the majors once upon a time. You're only a 23-year-old lad, so I'm, I'm sure, you know, you getting into Counter-Strike when CSGO came out 10 years ago, you're only 13. You want to give us the, uh, the TLDR of how you got into CS and competitive CS especially? Yeah, I mean, it all started in 1.6, even before CSGO. Oh, so, okay. Um, yeah, everything started because of my cousin. He was playing a lot of CS, and when he was coming to visit me, I started playing with him, and then it just continued. And uh, maybe it sounds crazy, but I actually attended a few local lunches in CS 1.6, even Damn. though I was like 11, 12, maybe. I was, you know, this little kid that nobody knew who I am, but I was destroying everyone. So that's how it started. And then I switched to CSGO, I think, uh, 2014. So I didn't start uh, when it came out. And yeah, in the first few years, I was just, uh, you know, playing a lot of matchmaking, face it. Uh, later, I got into, like, a bit more serious uh, mixes or teams. But at the start, it was just, you know, more like for fun. And I was at the same time going to school, doing other things. So I was trying to balance everything. Was it the, the classic, like you go to a LAN cafe and you're playing just like a 32 player server or some shit? Or were we talking like you, it was already pretty set that even at that young age, people were playing a lot of 5v5? No, it was a bit more set. There was, for example, I don't know, 16 teams and uh, there was like groups and we were just playing. It was like obviously low prize money and it was not that well organized, but it was fun. Okay. Yeah. No, those are the, those are the days that we all reminisce on and we go, you know, this is when you're you know, everyone knew all the, the local people who the who the biggest shit talkers were and everything like that. But you're going at such a young age, right? That's where, uh, I don't, were you the, the only like mega young one or was there other people your age there playing or was it mainly older teenagers? I think most of the time I was the youngest one because I was extremely long, uh, young. I was like 11 or 12 when I first went. And obviously back then even my parents didn't allow me to go. So I had some problems with that as well. So it was hard at some moments, but <laughs> I kept classic? doing it. Mm making up excuses like oh i need to go study for school and then uh, yeah i mean school and that stuff was always the first priority for for me but yeah nowadays it's not like that <laughs> yeah I, I just randomly went back through like your first event or whatever and i saw that you were playing with osama in that yes. team did you do you have a like this is a guy who i knew like not i, I didn't know personally or whatever but i knew the name from 1.6 days like the late 1.6 days and like early in CSGO, he was like, yeah, him and Entity were like the only team I knew from from your country. Do you have a history with, with the guy or was it just like one type thing? What's what's the story there? Uh, actually, I think he was the first one who kind of invited me to play with the big boys, you know, back then I was nobody. So he invited me first to play some, I don't know, face it stocks and uh, stuff like that. And then after some time, we started playing like open qualifiers, some regional uh, online tournaments, and that's how it started. But I have some history with him. Like I respect him a lot because he did a lot uh, in 1.6, and he kind of brought me up to the scene, I would say. You guys, um, uh, Prophet Strike, you guys know more about this part of the world than I do, uh, and maybe regional Counter-Strike in that part of the world more than I do. Well, you, so can you steer me in the in the right direction here? What 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 are we what are we lo looking at question wise? I think like essentially when when did you make the step from like playing casually into like oh I can compete in this and like trying to play online qualifiers and stuff like that? Where when did the switch happen from being just like casual enjoying the game to let's try and make something out of this Counter Strike thing? Yeah, I would say it was I think twenty twenty one. Uh, okay, so much that, later than when you started. Yeah, like. I mean, even before that, I was playing some open quals and stuff like that, but it was never like a, with a team. It was mostly some five Macedonian players just gathering and just playing open quality. But then I think it was 2021. Uh, we made like a team back then. It was the ex-Blue Jays core, some of us, not like the whole team. So we started playing 
Uh, first, we started with uh, some Balkan leagues that were not happening that often. So we wanted to play something else. And we started with uh, ESCA Open. And we went from Open to Main to Advanced to end up even higher later that year. But basically, that's how it started. And uh, obviously, we did some changes with that team. Blue Jays roster was completely different lineup, but I think the core is the same, three of us. Okay. Sick. So I think you, when a lot of people kind of notice you when uh, was when you won that ISF tournament, um, obviously you're playing some stuff online. As I said, like regional leagues, there was a, a period where you just started beating everyone in, in the region. And uh, then you won ISF, which not like a big, super cool land, but like people from all over the world competing in 2021, you won it, and then you won it next year as well, right? Or 2020, 2021. So was that uh, kind of a, I don't know, like a switch in terms of like, oh, we actually won some money. It was like, I think 15K for first place. Like, was that something that allowed you to put in more time and kind of switch from being like a good student in school and going like full time into, into playing? I think that tournament was pretty important for me and for our team because it was our first event outside of Macedonia. So it was kind of, we were kind of excited to go there and play. And the fact that we won it, it helped us a lot because uh, I would just say it seems like people in our country saw it that you can kind of earn money through this because before that I couldn't even explain it to my parents that you can earn money by playing CS. But after this tournament, they saw that we are actually kind of good at the game, that we can earn some money. And I think that's how everything started. After that, we continued to play some uh, online cups. And uh, the next year, we attended uh, also a few LANs. One of them was ISF, then some regional uh, LANs around the Balkan. And we won most of them. So I think everything started with ISF. Pretty, yeah. pretty nice. He won it again. We, you won it twice. Yeah, two years in a row. Okay, and then you beat Team Mongolia the second time around. Who was in that Mongolian team? This, it's this the is, Mongols. It, the full-on Blitz, Techno, Bartak, Annihilation, and Hasteka. Poor Hasteka, man. Uh, <laughs> he had a crack. He gave, he gave it a good shot. Respect on Hasteka's name. Okay, so the IESF tournaments... Uh, 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 wow. Did, do you feel personally that that put you on the, on the map of being noticed internationally? Or do you think that's something that uh, came a little bit later? I think it happened even before ISF because okay. there was some online tournaments before ISF, like the previous month that we that we won against some good teams. I remember against Eternal Fire and some teams like that. So that's kind of when everything started. But ISF was just like a confirmation that we are legit because before that there was rumors that we are cheating and this mm. kind of accusation. So yeah, everything started around that time around ISF. That's interesting, right? That that seems to happen quite often, though, at the moment, right? With uh, teams being accused of, of cheating online, there's quite a, quite a bit of that going on. At I the mean, moment. It's, bro, this is like the the eternal story of Counter Strike. It's like <laughs> yeah. any any time anybody new comes up in the in the scene and they do well online, everybody's like, "Oh fuck, let them do it online," and like it happens literally with every single player who comes up through the through the ranks. Well, the most what, reason why we've yeah. had is Para, right? Sorry, yeah, Shaka. I mean, that would be that would be one of them. We can get to them when we talk. <laughs> yeah, about I mean, us. what I wanted to ask about is kind of like the way that you came up uh, to me was like people started talking about okay, Blue Jays because you guys made it kind of like to the edge of the top thirty, or you were around there like very for a very long time, you know, competing like a lot around these tier two tournaments, and everybody was like at, at one point there were a lot of teams that were missing like a good in game leader, and obviously you know. You were also a guy who had a really good numbers for an in-game leader in the in the tier two scene. And at the same time, you were pretty young. How I just wanted to ask about kind of like how you came to in-game leading in the first place, you know, because again, like you were already on the radar as kind of like a 20-year-old in-game leader, you know, who who might be making it to the international scene next. It's actually funny because uh, in one of my first like teams that we started playing in 2021. Uh, I was not IGL at first, but then we did some changes and I don't know, I don't remember exactly what happened, but basically we needed an IGL and, and nobody wanted to be the one. So I was like, Classic. let me try this. <laughs> and yeah, uh, even before that, I felt like I understand the game good, even though back then it, I was playing in a much lower level. I felt like I, felt like I can do it and uh, I enjoy it since the first moment I tried it. One of those things, like when when you're in game leading, you either take to it or you don't. Like some people do it begrudgingly, but uh, I think well, you're 23 years of age right now. You're 
already made playoffs at a major, right? This is uh, you, you're yeah. making making some big leaps already in the in the career. Now, uh, I guess we can start looking forward a little bit, right? Uh, so we've spoken a bit regionally, then we've gone into the the more, I guess, you know, tier two, tier three realms, and then breaking through and getting the opportunity to join Apex, right? So this is the one where uh, everybody's like, okay, well. The Apex are there. I don't even know if at the time we would have called them a gatekeeper team, would we? I guess we would have called no. them like an upset team, someone who could potentially make a bit of a dent. But you joined in lieu of Shocks. So, Shocks, if for people who may have forgotten, Shocks was on Apex for a period of time. Um, that's like something three that, months, I think. Yeah. So, so people may, may have forgotten that. I think that was that was after his liquid stint, right? But regardless, yeah. where so you joined uh, Nork, Jacob, Stiko, and Jail, and yourself, and then Cuban was the coach over there. Um, how did how did that all come about? Getting that opportunity, who who was the one that that scouted you, or you know, kind of, I guess, had interest to pick you up into the team? Yeah, I don't know. Everything was kind of unexpected and kind of out of nowhere. It was just a normal day, and suddenly I got a call like uh, that. Apex is interested in me, and uh, I had a call with their uh, general manager or something, and they wanted to do a trial with me in like the next few days as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, we scheduled a trial for two days, but then these two days went pretty good, so they wanted two more. So it ended up being like four or five days in total. And then that was like, I don't know, maybe two months before the season ends. So actually I had to end the season with my ex, my old team with Blue Jays. Mm. So after the trial, I came back to Blue Jays. We continued playing. And then a few weeks after the trial, I got notification that I'm, I will be joining Apex that they want me. And I just finished the season with Blue Jays. And uh, after that, for the next season, I joined Apex. And then the start, it was kind of unbelievable because before that, I, I've always played with my friends, with my Macedonian friends. And now suddenly I'm playing in the same team with players like Jake and Stiko. I have a lot of respect for them even before I joined the team, before I joined Apex. So yeah, and at the start, it was a bit, uh, not hard, but... Maybe I was doubting myself a little bit because it's something that I've never tried before, playing with players that I've never seen or met or talked to and a completely new coach. Everything was new for me. But uh, once we started playing, uh, everything just clicked instantly and we, we were improving a lot, I would say. There's a lot of um, questions this now like invokes for me, right? So first yeah. of all, <laughs> I, I just want to start something like quite rudimentary, but Blue Jays, but they no longer exist anymore. What type of org was that? Were you guys you get getting paid like a decent salary and stuff to play then? Or, or, or what type of situation was that? And how did the, was it an easy transfer process? Was it like, yeah, sure. Like no dramas, mate. Good luck in the future. Yeah, it was a German organization and uh, we had like decent salary, like obviously not close to like tier one or tier 1.5, but we had all right salary for what we were doing. And uh the transfer was pretty easy. Like everything happened in a few days. So not much to say about them. Okay. And then the next thing for somebody so young and also the first time going into in-game leading a team like this, and then obviously in English as well. How, how did you, did you go in like, you know, you're a new, you've, you've just gone into prison and you want to go up and like King hit the, the biggest guy in the prison yard to get the respect on Kixon's name. Like what, how, how do you, how do you make sure that the other guys are going to respect what you have to say as an in-game leader? Uh, I would say that I was just trying to be myself and not uh, change too much because they liked what they saw on the trial and on the trial I was just doing my things. I was They let me just call and do whatever I want and they liked it. So when I actually joined the team, I was trying to repeat the same and uh, I think they had, even though I was kind of unknown at that time, they had respect for me from the first day. I think it was like, we had a good, uh, what's the word? relationship in the team like everyone was respecting each other and uh, it went great okay nice yeah no well i guess i guess that's key right if they're they're getting to put you on trial so if they're liking what they're seeing that's that's great news all right boys where do you want to pivot from here what questions we got i wanted to just ask you i th think it's very interesting like how you described the whole uh, move from as you said like playing with more or less friends like people that you knew for a long time you know you make one roster change but it's like kind of always the same mixture of people either you pug with them or you saw them at lands or you know stuff like that and then going into like a professional team like how did it feel to kind of leave the the macedonian core behind because like obviously there's 
pretty good talented players there. Tassanito we saw also came to Apex. I think Necrogenesis for a while was rostered or, or like rumored to connected to a few different rosters, but it didn't really happen. So did it feel like kind of sad in a way? Did, did you feel like you could do more with uh, that core? Uh, I was definitely feeling sad because I played with these people for like a few years in a row and it was hard to leave them. But at the same time, I think uh, with the roster we had, especially that it was only Macedonian people, I think we did even more than enough, even better than people expected. So I think we kind of reached our maximum, which was top 30. We were ex exactly top 30 on HOTV as our like, top ranking. And uh, yeah, as I said, obviously, I was feeling sad at the start. I was uh, watching all of their games they were playing after I left. But uh, after a few months, they disbanded and... Uh, now it's completely different time. <laughs> yeah. So you made a good good choice at the right time, I guess. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but what about what about calling in English? How did you adapt to that so so quickly and so well? I think it was a bit weird the first few days, maybe. But uh, I kind of got used to it fast because even before I joined Apex, I was playing FPLC at the time or some other packs, and like I was speaking English quite often. I would say in CS. So it was a bit hard maybe the first few days because you're not like I was speaking English the whole time after I joined Apex. So I needed a few days to adapt, but after that, it was easy, I would say. What kind of any game leader are you? How would you describe yourself? You know, because it seems like, you know, for a guy who would be very structured, it would probably be pretty hard to make the transition like so easily. Like, are you more like a free flowing guy? How would you describe your style? Yeah, I would say that I'm. Uh, it's not that hard for me to adapt to the people that I'm playing with. And uh, I feel like in all of the teams that I've played, people have uh, enough freedom to do their things and they're comfortable to play their own roles. Of course, I'm not saying that if someone wants to do something for 15 rounds, of course, I will not allow that. But we have like a, like a deal, let's say, on how much freedom everyone has. And I think that's uh, that's the best thing about my coding because I'm still coding my things, but at the same time, people have... Uh, their own place and things they can do in the rounds. When you when you first came to the team, right uh, to Apex, and obviously um, you have an established team and players who have certain things that they like to do and things that they have been doing, and then you're saying, well, in the trial, you're we're just calling so what you wanted to call. So I guess you know you guys were you guys doing pracs on those days before you played scrims to to at least know what you had at your disposal in terms of what utility these guys knew and what positions they like to play on defaults or was it just like free for all calling where you were like all right you guys do map control here we'll look for a pick with nork over here like what, what how does that process start just about the trial right yeah because then i imagine uh, once you're in the team it changes yeah but basically on the trial, uh, I remember like, let's say if uh, the first prac was at one, we had like one or two hours of theory before that. Okay. So basically uh, I was doing the theory, so they allowed me to explain to them like how we want to play this map. On the, in the trial? Defeat. Yes. Damn, okay. So, I mean, obviously they added a few things as well, but like I would say 90% it was my things. And I just wanted to see how I think about the game, how I like to call and... Uh, yeah, that's how it went. Okay. So once you're then more established, is it now them bringing the ideas with like Cuban and stuff of the way that they want to approach the game and, and blending it together? Or because like I looked at the way that you guys would play Counter Strike and you'd cause like chaos all over the map, right? And then from there, you'd be able to exploit whatever gaps you could find. Was that like a you thing? Was that a Cuban thing? Well, where where's that come from? I would say that it was both because I was always the kind of figure leader that likes to and the call on the fly. So I had sometimes some crazy ideas, but then Kuban also had some ideas and we kind of mixed that together to create something new. And I would say that, let's say half of the things that uh, we, we were using or playing in the playbook were mine. The rest was something new that we created together, but it was like a mix of both, I would say. Okay. Because there was some some really fun stuff that you guys had that were like especially ancient. I really like watching you guys on ancient. You always had some a couple of little I call them gimmicks, but you had some moves that a lot of people weren't expecting. Like a lot of stuff top of B ramp that you'd exploit like that molly you'd throw, and then you'd be able to scale in it to in the site and stuff. And these fucking nerds, they've worked it all out. And yet you, I thought one of the things as well that um, I liked watching with you and the calling was you were you had like good momentum calling. 
Like I felt like you were always able to like punish and like know, okay, well, they're going to go heavy here now. We're going to do this type of a hit. I thought that was one of the keys that, that you guys had as a team, which is always fun to watch. Is Ancient your favorite map? Uh, top two, I would say top yeah, two. Yeah, I can tell. I, you, <laughs> you can you can tell. You can, yes, okay, all right, yeah. all right. Um, well, okay, what other questions we got about Apex? I have just a, a, just a qu quick question, like relating to the IGLing part. You kind of explained some of it, but my question is where did you get the inspiration to be like okay this is my style and like when did you discover this was your style of calling right because coming through all of these different iterations of the local teams was it something that you like look through how other teams were playing it's like some of the big igls at the time like 2018 19 like where did the inspiration come from uh or just trial maybe, and error <laughs> oh maybe it's a bit weird but it was Basically, the whole time I was just trying to be myself and do like code the way I want. I, I'm not saying that I didn't watch any demos, but basically, I was just being myself, coding what I feel like. And uh, even nowadays, some people are like complimenting me, like you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. But like, I'm just thinking myself, like I'm just doing my thing. I'm not doing anything crazy, you know. It's just me. And yeah. Okay. So just your vision of the game. I, I think yeah. that. The thing is, we're getting to see you and Shui, I guess, are probably the the main two newer ones on the map as far as like younger in-game leaders go. Am I missing anybody? I'm probably missing somebody. I'm sorry to whoever I missed. But the two of you, are, I suppose, the, the the more standout names in that department right now. Um, and obviously, a, a, a big factor for that was, and this, this is a transition, guys. We're going to talk about the Blast Major semi-final run. Uh, so, look, first major... And you have a crazy run like that. Now, a lot of a lot of the teams, actually, when uh, we look at who hasn't qualified for for this major, I think like four out of the seven teams possible, is that many or was it three? Anyway, I think it's four, didn't qualify for this major around, but a, the Apex core did. You've done it now with a whole new team. Um, but let's, yeah, let's reflect a little bit at the time. Was that kind of like a dream run? when you guys were able to tear through the competition there, what was, what was the Paris major like? Cause that's your first major. Yeah, it, it, it was crazy. And to me, it's still crazy when I think about it, because our goal was kind of to kind of to just qualify for the major. And even that maybe seemed a bit unrealistic. If you look at like Apex before the major, before I joined them, they were like top 60 HOTV or something like that. So uh, we were just happy to get to the major, but then when we went there, I feel like everything changed. I feel like we improved day by day, and maybe it sounds crazy, but I think in like during that period, during the major, I think we were like, I don't know, maybe one of the best teams there, in my opinion, because I feel like everything we were doing was just top level. Like individually, we were on point. We had some amazing anti strat that I remember to this day. It's actually the play that you mentioned on ancient, uh, uh, on ancient for the top Barana Moli. Mm. It was anti-strat against I don't know who, and then we just kept it in the playbook because it was working all the time. So I feel like during that major, everything was just perfect in a way. Whatever we did was just good for us, and we were just improving game by game. I think we the pressure kind of hit us in the semifinal against Vitality, and we didn't play good at all, and we still managed to win like... 14 and 13 rounds or something like that. So that kind of shows how good we were playing. It was a pretty interesting blend of players that you had with you, right? Obviously, Jacob and Stika being the two more experienced uh, members in the team at the time. Um, but it's not like... like Nork had been around for a decent period of time. With and JL and you, I guess, were the two newer names in, in, in that regard. So what do you think it was about being at a big event like that and uh, like... I, it's it's hard to quantify because there was a lot of teams who had runs that people nobody expected, right? And you guys were just one of one of those many teams. Um, it's just it's it's so strange to see because to have players like Jacob and Stiko kind of returning to good form after a lengthy. Well, I guess Jacob. It's not that he hasn't he ever dropped off. He just wasn't on a, a good enough team, was he? Really? Because it went from the hundred thieves. To, fuck. Sorry, everybody. Just whacked. That was my <laughs> knee on the desk. Shouldn't be moving around so much. Um, I'm just. I'm just trying to think because, like, that major. We're essentially a year ago now, right? And just with the amount of teams that were able to have runs that nobody expected, but then the Apex was able to has been able to back it up since with with decent results. So there's obviously something about the way that the game's been approached. But the way you're saying this, like, it just something was unlocked at that event. That's what it seems like to me. Like something, something, something was unlocked for you and the team at that event that that was made you be able to 
play at that level. And I, I'm just having a hard time putting my finger on what that could have been or like how that's even possible. Like it's, it's a really interesting thing, right? Like, oh yeah, we just go to the major, my first major, and we just fucking make it to the semifinal. Like, isn't that, that's just, like you think about it, that's fucking insane. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, even before I joined Apex, when I had the first meetings, even with the general manager or whatever, they instantly said that their goal is the Paris major. Like this whole time, even before the major, we, we were playing some online cups for like three months. All this time, our focus was only on the major. And uh, maybe it was not that good at the time because before the major, we didn't play that good in the online cups. But once we went to the major, it felt like everything changed. Like everyone was playing better. Everyone was like motivated more. Focused, more. Or, yeah. yeah, everything was just different. It felt like we were so confident in our game that it was crazy, actually. Yeah. I think that's it's also an interesting thing too, because uh, the, the average viewer and uh, and people fans at home, I don't think they really understand like the prioritizing of events that happens and, and it doesn't happen for some teams in terms of like, can you explain a bit when you say like everything was like preparation for the major, what that meant? Because I understand it as like you're playing to improve more so than to have like short term results and like oh let's just find a quick fix for this instead of that you go and look at okay how is our approach start from the basics redo everything if needed which in initially is just going to be worse right is that what you're talking about uh if, yeah before the major i think we had like a good boot camp of like i don't know a week maybe and during that boot camp we were like just playing the whole time trying to you know, grind as much as possible. And we had some talks about our, about the mental part of the game, because usually we're struggling with that, especially in some online cups, because yeah, for example, J Cam and Stick are some more experienced players and playing CCT for them or some other mm -hmm. online cup is not the, you know, the most motivating thing in the world. Uh, and it was not only them, I'm just giving an example. It was kind of all of us. So we were talking about so many things before the major and i think most of them we did them successfully at the major and that you can see by the results that we were doing the things right hmm. well it uh i guess if we continue to pivot forward right it, it, it put you even because but this is a short period of time you said just when we started this conversation correct me if i'm wrong 2021 was when you started taking things more seriously yeah kind of and we're only now just in 2024 yeah. So that's all happened quite quickly, mate. That's uh, it's quite a short period of time that you've been able to get yourself into uh, a, an organization like Heroic. That uh, these last couple of years must feel like they've fucking flown by. Yeah, it's actually insane. I still can't believe it. Sometimes where I am today, it doesn't seem uh, real. You know, at some moments. I want to ask you just one one more thing about that major run. Um, is is the liquid game one of those things that you just like remember because you fucking owned them individually as well in, in that game and made the semifinals? Is that just one of those things that you just like randomly Having doing a bad some day. You, or like you're doing some dishes and you're just like ah oh, liquid detergent is like ah oh, I remember when I owned liquid that day that was a fucking good day and just like smile a bit. Is that one of those memories? Yeah, I think so. It was uh, probably the best game I've ever played. Like. Maybe not like individually, but if you consider it was major quarterfinal, it's something that I will always remember. And uh, yeah, I think it was we won two zero if I remember. And yeah. uh, I think we were so confident going into that game because we already played them once and we beat them, and we had some crazy anti strat against them. Like everything, we we knew what we need to do, and I think if we played them like ten more times, we would have won every time. Yeah. We were all confident, and uh, I had a great individual game, so it's a game to remember for sure. Did Did you have a favorite teammate in Apex? Yeah. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say it. I mean, look, you know, you you can say you love them all, but there's got to be surely there was one that you enjoyed playing with more than others, right? There's always a yeah. the, little bit of I synergy. I, I liked all of them, but uh, maybe I was the closest with Jail. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, Big J.O., I think he was in chat just before. Well, you, you both, well, you're the two who are no longer on Apex. Obviously, Jail you, you, left right after that major. I mean, that, yeah, he, did he, he left Renavi straight away. Yeah. Wow. wow. How, was that, how was that period? I mean, obviously, you know, like you have this massive high and then straight after that, you know, you lose one of your players and that's, it has to feel bad. 
yeah, it didn't feel that good because we knew how important of a player he is for us. And uh, not only about like the in-game part of the game, but also outside of the game, he was bringing a lot to the team. But uh, yeah, the first few months after he left were a bit rough, but I think towards the end, we were kind of bringing our form back. And I think now after I left, they're doing pretty good as well. So, Do you watch much of them? Well, I guess if you're going to play against them or whatever now, do you still have like a, a bond with any of the players on the team and stuff and talk to them or are you you're off, off doing your own shit now? Because when you, when you leave a team, it, that tends to get severed, right? Uh, I don't talk that much to them when I'm at home, but when I'm at events, I always at least say hi, sometimes even uh, talk a bit more, but I still talk to, to most of them. All of yeah. them, I would say. They're really close friends to me and we were teammates for such a long time. I mean, not that long, maybe, but... Some good experiences together, yeah. though. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this heroic situation. The heroic falls, falls apart, and uh, it really falls apart. Everything kind of fucking blows up. It's all over social media. There's some good times going on. People make some, some fun jokes about it all, and uh, then they're left with only two players. Where were you in the in the in the pecking order of all this, right? Because we know that Saul went over to uh, to be the coach quite early, but uh, then in terms of of the the way the events transpired, can you run us through from your perspective how how the transfer and and getting contacted and everything went down? Yeah, it uh, like similar to Apex, it happened like out of nowhere. I remember it was just a normal Prague day, and uh, after we were done, I was supposed to I don't remember like go somewhere. And uh, my agent called me and he said, you need to talk to Heroic. And I'm like, okay, when? He said, now. Well, interested. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's do it. But I need to go in like 30 minutes. And he's like, it's fine. And then I talked to the general manager of Heroic. And the same day, instantly after that, I talked to So. But at that time, I didn't even know that he is the coach of Heroic. So everything happened like in the exact same day. And after that meeting, I realized that they're really interested in me and he really wants to bring me to Heroic uh, after the talk with So. And yeah, uh, it took a few, we uh, few weeks, if I'm not mistaken, to complete all of the transfers and all of that stuff to get sorted because the season was still ongoing and I still had like two more even LAN events with Apex. Two LAN events, one was in uh, Finland, Elisa, the other one was ESL Challenger Atlanta. So after all of that was done, then everything became official. I mean, you... this was this was like in the works. Like you say, it happened really quickly for you. But like overall, I think it was in the works for a long time, because I think some of the players didn't even know like where they were going to end up for for a while. Um, what did you know from the beginning that was going to happen? Like, did you know the whole the whole squad from the start, or or how did that go? Uh, at the beginning, I knew that they want to bring me. I knew that uh, Sush is staying, uh, and they want to bring Nerds, but Nerds was not confirmed at all. So at the start, there was not much. Only Siush and So were kind of confirmed in the team. And it took like, I don't know, maybe like three weeks to get all of the names on the team. Because first, Heroic had some other ideas, then everything fell apart. And uh, at the end, we ended up with this roster. Mm -hmm. So what, what was the selling point for you then? Like, did you already commit before the whole roster was completed? Or um, what? Yeah, how did that go? Uh, I kind of, yeah, I committed to it because I knew that Stowe will be the coach, Siush will be there, and Nerds was not confirmed, but kind of like 99%. So I felt like that's a good core. And then I heard the other names that they were interested in, and uh, most of them were like, you know, tier one good players that I would like to play with, and uh, I accepted the offer when I got it. Can can I ask why, when you knew Saw, heard Saw was going to be the coach, what about Saw? Or, or how how do you have such high high praise for Saw before you would, you know, just just from the work he had done with Ents? Like, what 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 enticed you about him as a coach? I think mostly about the work he's done at Ents because I think they were like consistent top five team during the last year, and uh, also I've heard some great things about him from other people. So, and also I had a few talks with him uh, during all of this process of uh, getting the roster. So. Yeah, I, I trusted a lot in him, and uh, I think he's an amazing coach, honestly. Because it, it, it's one of these things, you're going from from a roster with players that you already already know, obviously to, I, and I don't know financially here, I, Apex has a lot of money, don't they? They're like Norwegian oil barons or some shit. I, 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 I don't know what exactly they are, but like 
you're going to a bigger name in heroic, but financially, maybe that came with a with a bonus as well. Did would you just feel like it was a well, like things have worked out like hindsight's twenty twenty, but but at the time, was it like I just want a new project? Like, what well, what was going through your mind at the time with it? Uh, it was not really like that. I was happy in Apex because I think we were still doing good, even though it was not the major form anymore. I think we were still, you know, playing good, attending a lot of, we played a lot of tier one tournaments. So even if I didn't join Heroic, I would be happy at Apex. But, uh, at that time I felt like, you know, maybe offers like this don't come that often. So I kind of wanted to accept it because I really liked the core of the team and just in general, Heroic seemed like a, a they had a good offer for me. Mm. You guys okay. actually played pretty well, like even after that point. I guess after you had committed to Heroic already, you were talking about Elisa and Atlanta, and I think you went to the grand final both times, right? Yeah, we went to the final in both uh, Elisa and, uh, and uh, Atlanta. And I think during Elisa, I think it was not even confirmed that I'm leaving. So, for example, for Atlanta, you can say that we played without any pressure or something sure. like that. But in Elisa, it wasn't like that. And I just want to mention one thing that I think helped us a lot during the last two, the, uh, last two events with Apex. I think we brought sports psychologists before these two events. And uh, it helped us a lot because I think that was one of the main reasons why we were struggling before that. If you look at the results after the major, up until Elisa, it was oh. much different than the major or what it is now for Apex. So I think that's one of the good things that I did for us before I left. Hmm. Yeah. And people in chat are like saying, like, I'm talking about the fact that you said like Shush was confirmed and heroic and essentially saying that like Tessis wasn't confirmed. But I think if I, if I remember correctly, like the, the rumor at the time was that heroic was going to go for like the ends trio, which would be like some pious nerds and I guess Madden, if you would be joining, or maybe it was Snappy, but I think Snappy was leaning. I think that was Falcons. supposed to be Madden, yeah. From the yeah. So, so that's why it would make sense. Like, even if, this is, is like pretty good player overall, and he's still again showing now in heroic. Yeah, the anchor and shush and kicks. If you have, leader. if you yeah. can, if you have a trio, especially if you can get Nerds and Sun Pius, which are amazing players, and you get the all the core and the invites and everything, this is not worth that. I don't think. I don't think a lot of people would disagree. I know people will read into it as being like you know backstabbing trader org or whatever, but I think that some things just business wise would make sense. Um, but yeah, that didn't really pan out, right? You you needed to start from the open qualifiers and which is crazy. Away. Yeah, that that was that's. Uh, I guess that's where we go next. Is that what we're ta talking about next? I guess just putting heroic together and then starting the season. I don't know when you started the season before New Year's even. Just starting practicing for the open qualifiers because they are so so early. I, I think I had a brief word with you and Nerds at the front of the hotel in Katowice and you guys were saying just how long you've been like on the road already since the start of the year because of the open qualifiers and shit and it sounded mental, mate. So you want to run us through the process from from once the team came together and it was all all green light? Yeah, so I think uh, Heroi completed the roster officially like 21st or 22nd of December, officially, the new lineup. Yep. And then on 26th, we started practicing or like uh the 26th of december yes we had like three boxing day, day. yeah we had 26 27 28 i'm not sure about 29th so we had like three or four days of prague then we took a few days off around new year we came back on 3rd of january we practiced third fourth and fifth if i'm not mistaken from home and then on sixth we went to boot camp and we were there i mean we were away from home from that moment until end of Kato. Fuck so, hell. Yeah, we had like uh, two weeks of boot camp where we played the open quality, then we go to the close quality, but there was like one week in between these two. So this one week we used it to practice a lot and then uh, the close quality was happening. We go to the RMR and then we left directly to blast groups, spring uh, groups. From there we went directly to Kato and then finally we went home. Had a bit of a break. Yeah, a few days break and for, then straight to RMR. Yeah, for like a week, right? It was, an, yeah, it, was, it, was yeah. um, it was exactly a week, I think. Exactly Back a week. Yeah, no. Okay, so right now, you're probably what, going to have a week off and then get into boot camp, or are you guys already still practicing for the major? Uh, I think we have like five of days in total after RMR, and then we're okay. going to... We're going to have some online practice and also some online tournaments. We have the Blast Showdown. That's right. 
And we also have uh, IEM Dallas closed quality that will also play from home. And then I'm not sure if we'll have bootcamp before the major, but that's the next basically. So how, how do you things start you were doing stuff just after after christmas and then you have a bit of a break and then you're doing stuff just after new year's and then you're getting into tournaments straight away so in the first so you've already done this process not that long ago with apex did that make it easier to be able to to start doing this again you already knew what you needed to do yeah i think it was easier as you already said i did it with apex and uh, in apex also everything happened so fast like we also started to practice uh, much earlier than everyone because back then also we were playing uh, i think close quality for rmr for the paris rmr paris mm -hmm. major so yeah it was kind of the same process again and uh, i kind of expected what's going to happen it was easier this time i would say Okay. Why was it was just easier because you'd already done it, or you you feel like you have more experienced pieces around you, so there was less you had to do from that that side of things, or a bit of both. I think a bit of both. Uh, I think it's it's nice that I have some more experienced players now, and uh, I feel like they're helping me more, and also so they're helping me a lot with like some in-game stuff and some outside of the game stuff. So everyone is contributing a lot to the team in every possible way, and it's. It's easier, I would say. I mean, this, the Katowice run must have been a big confidence boost, right? Because you start out with kind of blast groups, which did went pretty badly for you guys. I mean, you had that horrible loss to Cloud9 at the beginning and then lose to Big, who I don't think people had a, like big expectations of anyway. So that must have been a pretty bad start for the team kind of emotionally, you know, and just like thinking about, okay, Karavis is around the corner, then Aramar is around the corner. You know, we kind of have to be in a good form if you want to make it to the major. So how how did it go from like the emotional side and just kind of being able to deal with blast groups and coming back from that to to be able to beat, you know, Vitari and was it you almost beat G two as well in that yeah. uh, in that round? Astralis was one of those as well. So how did that go from your perspective? Uh, like if you look at the results at Blast, obviously it's bad. But after we rewatched the games and we saw what happened, we. We kind of saw that we are not actually playing that bad. We are just missing some little details that uh, usually get fixed after some time. You cannot expect all of these things to to be good after we've been playing together for like three weeks in total. And uh, we actually saw it in Katowice that uh, all of these little mistakes and details got a bit better. And we're actually able to close out the rounds and the games now, something that we were not able to do it at Blast. I think we just... It was not that hard emotionally. We just accepted the fact that we lost. And to be fair, it was not the most important tournament if you compare it to Kato or RMR. So we just rewatched the games, saw what we did wrong. And I think we did good to improve all of these things for the for Kato. It would can I, I this is a this is a I guess a strange question, but um it's not that strange. What am I saying? Is it was it nice being on the road with each other from the sense that you could just talk through all of the issues that you were having together, right? Like you're, you, you're at the airport, you can talk Counter-Strike. You're going out to dinner, you can talk Counter-Strike. And you just kind of like crammed a boot camp into the first two months of the year, essentially. Like, did that make life easier? Would you have preferred to have been at home where you can do, all right, guys, we're going to do theory, then everyone can fuck off for lunch, then we come back and we'll play some prax. And like, what, what model is preferential to you? I always prefer bootcamp because I think it's much more effective. Maybe this time it was a bit too much because we were away for like a month, but I think we did well, even though we were together like 24 seven, like every day, every every day for like a month. I think we did well. Nobody got like bored of it. Everyone enjoyed it and it made our life easier. Like, uh, as you said, it's much easier to talk about CS. You can talk all the time. And I think we spent a lot of time on like these talks. So it was not only just practice and playing and adding new stuff to the playbook, but it was also just talking about the game and some things outside of the game that helped us improve a lot, I would say. I think when, when you when you look at it, because when this team came together, it wasn't very highly rated, right? I don't think many people were sitting there going, oh yeah, this heroic team's going to be fucking sick. It was like, oh yeah, it was fine. Like, it's just pretty pretty mid. Like, it's maybe on the upper end of mid. And then you you look at the the pieces that you have though, and everybody's like hungry to prove something. Like Nikodos coming back, getting another opportunity at like a, a big org, right? Shush and Tessus being the two that get left in the dust, and the other two nicked off and went to fucking Astralis, and these two get left behind. You're still a young in in game leader getting a chance to make his mark. Thanks for the raid, Monacy. Fucking sick spam in the chat, but uh, and then Nerds, right? He's one of the pieces of Ents, but Nerds is still quite early on in his career, and he's very hungry as well. And then even the same with the coach Saw. Right, so everybody was saying to prove. 
that that feels like that must have because everyone's on the no one's old and jaded everybody's the average age of your team is 24 everyone's everyone's young and hungry like and i guess that's why someone in the chat said oh a month is a month even that long a month's a long time to be away from home living in hotels like i think i think people don't realize like it's it, it's fucking draining so i don't i guess i made more of a statement than a question there um but you have a young hungry team so i guess that's kind of helped you at this point what about the the opinion that the community seemed to have of your team did was there much discussion with, from that from you guys internally of like oh they just think we're average i don't think there was discussions inside the team but uh, i personally read some of the comments and uh, i would say that i take them in a positive way because it kind of motivates me to prove everyone wrong because when we formed this team when it was announced everyone was like what's this you know like this is not a good team or like it's not like a contender for titles or trophies or whatever but i disagree with it and but i respect every everyone's opinion but uh, i think all of these comments just makes us stronger i would say oh what what comment annoyed you the most <laughs> there was i don't know there was some bad comments but just in general i think they motivate us to prove people wrong i don't remember some specific comments it's just in general yeah, they couldn't have been that bad, Prof, if he doesn't remember a specific one. Doesn't have it like printed up on the <laughs> or wall. Or maybe in front it wasn't that bad, so he doesn't think. <laughs> <laughs> Screenshot it on his phone wallpaper. All right. Well, um, do we want to continue on this path or do we want to jump into skin you there? And then once we get into RMR discussion, we can throw questions at Kickson's direction we as we go. That. All right. We all right. All right. right. Skinner, yeah. Kickson, you familiar with skin you know? You, you tuned in before. You've seen what goes down. I'm not sure. All right, that's fine. I can explain it. That's part of my job, mate. We're about to yeah. do a quiz, right? And you're going to be the, the man as the, well, you're not the quiz master. You're the one here to answer the questions. There are going to be five questions, multiple choice, A, B, or C. There's a link that Lucas has just put in the chat for you, I do believe. You can click that bad boy there. We're going to go through the questions. Every question that you get correct, we move the slider up one little notch, right? And potentially, you could win a $50 skin voucher for somebody in the chat, right? So all the people in chat right now are going to start typing trader in chat. They're going to enter the raffle and however many questions you get right the people at home or at least one of them wins a skin voucher so you're like the people's okay. champion right now you ready to kick this off this is it all right who wants to be a skin you know brought it to you by trade it.gg question number one which of the following countries has recorded the fewest major participants montenegro north macedonia fucking hell guys or croatia well he's locked in croatia immediately did is dimitri he do these questions prof uh, no, I actually did them the same. You're starting the fucking incident then, are you, mate? All right. Well, kicks in. You, you've locked in Croatia. Why are you so confident? Well, you, you're correct. Prof, is that where you're from? You're from Croatia? Zero. <laughs> and because it, it doesn't count uh, talent. So <laughs> better than we've had some appearances. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, a big fat zero. Are you like, the only Croatian to, to be like officially tied to the. Uh... <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Oh, unfortunately. Shit. All right. There's no like observers or like people abroad production. No, we have a great Maybe observer in, in Rainbow Six. So uh, that's that's it. Wrong game. Oh. Still yeah. a first person yeah. shooter. All right, question number two. One from one. That's beautiful. Uh, Jacob made three major semifinals with Apex in 2023, Renegades in 2019, and who in 2015? LGB phase or G2? Kixon's locked in G2. Very confident with the answers mm -hmm. here, Kixon. Of course, you're asking about my ex-teammate. Oh, well, you got all right. Fair enough. Let's do, see. Do let's... you remember watching this? I remember that he. Wait, what is this music? We had some crazy. <laughs> we can hear it. It's a dog. Yeah, Lucas is out of music to, to make it a bit more dramatic. I remember that during this major, he had some crazy game on cash. I don't That's remember against who. That, that, was, that was against. Like, I think it might have been against G2 even. It was on no, G2. He, he was uh, not against he wasn't. G2, but uh, yeah. Uh, Phase. Yeah. But I, I remember watching been. some of that games that he played there. Oh, well, fuck it out. You're smashing these. All oh, right, two King, King two. Win. There you go. That's the one. Not, not FaZe at the it time. It couldn't have been FaZe. I don't think FaZe was in yet. King yeah, win. There yeah, was yeah, King yeah. Win at the time. Yeah, all right. All right. Question number three. Thor joins Heroic from Ents, but what is the last team he played for? Ents, Havu, or Kova? Fucking like nailing this. Yeah. I thought these questions might be hard, but he's just like locking it. No, no comment. Just nailing yeah just smash it up actually All right. this is a question that someone asked him a few weeks ago and that's how i know what, from the team no it was i don't know we were someone else asked him like what teams he played for and that's how okay I know. all right all right so recent recent knowledge all right question number yeah. four in 2018 testers played for an org that also had a balkan roster which one binary dragons 
How did he even get through? I didn't even get uh, squared. I... He's locked in. I've never heard of squared. He fucking <laughs> hell. What? what? Who the fuck is squared? I, don't know. So, I, I think I think it was a, like a Danish dude that was like connected to pharmacies or something in some way, <laughs> and then he, for some reason he had a Balkan team for a while. It was like Holmes, I think, on the lineup and stuff and stuff like that. Uh, maybe even Nexa. I think Nexa was on the really? lineup for a bit. Uh, but I I, uh, I also thought this was a t tough question. I don't know how he's like instantly knowing that Tessas also played on, on. How do you know this? I know my teammates. My ex <laughs> Shit. You can see that, yeah. This is crazy. All right, question number five. This is for the clean sweep. Which pairs of teams qualified for the first CS2 major? Astralis and Falcons, NIP and Fnatic, Saw and Koi. That's an easy one. All right, well, you five from five. You smashed through those. I can't quite believe the pace at which you've done that. That's going to be I record think that might speed. I think might be the fast, fastest one. Yeah. <laughs> and you Pretty didn't even sure. have to think about any of them. And it was not easy either. Like, it was one of the harder ones. Yeah. Fucking hell, that's five from five. Well, Kixon, you've just won smooth underscore operator, a $50 skin voucher for trader.gg. So uh, he should be very happy with that performance. That's insane. We've done very well. This is where the lights start flashing, the music plays. Uh, <laughs> you know, they bring you out a bouquet of flowers. Wow. You know, like I the only thing, the only thing that would have made this better, you know, if we did like the the first guy who won like the million dollars on the, on the American. I don't know if you've seen that story, but the guy just called his father on like a uh, last, oh, tip, yeah, like on yeah, the last yeah. question of the million dollar question, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'm just going to win the million dollars. Like, yeah. I don't actually need your help, you know? <laughs> the phone that's, a friend, that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, well. That, that's the only thing, you know, that could have happened here. Damn. Well, it's fucking traded are going to want their money back for this week because the quiz is so goddamn quick. Well, uh, look, <laughs> let's let's take the ad break. We'll uh, get in contact with Smooth Operator and we'll come back from the ad break and start talking about the RMRs. Be right back. Best esports odds. VIP program and a variety of bonuses. Fast and easy withdrawals. Bet on every possible CSGO matching tournament. As well as any other esports game. Only on 22Bet. Are you tired of your boring old skins? Head to Trade It and trade them for exciting new ones within seconds. With 24-7 support, massive inventory, free giveaways, and low fees, Trade It is the highest rated trading platform in the market. What are you waiting for? Start trading today for a $5 bonus, only on Trade It. All right, we are back from the break. Prof's just uh, gone to, to the lavatory, everybody. Nature's called, but uh, we don't need him to get started. We're going to be turning our attention now to talk about the RMRs for Europe. Uh, the RMRs for Asia start tonight slash tomorrow morning, and then the Americas in about a week's time, something along those lines. So we are just going to be discussing all the action that happened for uh, Group A, Group B, and then the LCQ. Uh, I'll just quickly rattle off the teams which qualified, and then we'll go into it in more detail. So this is just kind of to cap it off for the people who maybe are just tuning in and, and didn't watch any of those games. So uh, from Group A, it was VP, G2, Navi, FaZe, Koi, Eternal Fire, Saw, and Amcal. From Group B, it was Mouth, Cloud9, Spirit, Vitality, Apex, Heroic, Ecstatic, uh, and Ents. And then for the last chance qualifier, it was Nine Pandas. Okay, so uh, I, we the seeding still needs to get done at some point, doesn't it? Striker to determine who is going to be the the um, what is oh, it, opening gonna, stage and gonna, elimination. Yeah, skip, the, skip the opening stage. Yeah, yeah. it's good. It's just supposed to be the top seven teams in Europe and top one team in America. So, so by the um, seeding, uh, by the valve ranking. Yeah. When will the Valve ranking be? Are they going to update the day it? After. Uh, it should be either the day that the America Sarmar ends or the day after. Uh, I think it's March 5th. March 5th and the major... But, the, mate, it isn't, aren't teams flying out to the major on March 15th? 15th, yeah. So, so that's on the, 10, so days. 10 days. 10 days, potentially. I mean, right. that's not... Honestly, well, that's yeah, not bad. I guess that's okay because Valve are playing, paying for the flights. But if I was a TO and I was paying for flights 10 days before... yeah. Fuck that's it not, have it's to, also hard to, worry to about plan it. like boot camps and everything. It's like you don't know which days you're starting. Yeah. You know? It's just kind of making the whole I mean, thing I a think, bit tricky. I think most of the teams can Work probably guess because if you look at you know, how recent the Valve ranking is, it's like, I don't know, I was looking through it and, and it seemed relatively obvious for most of the teams who, was, who, it's go who it was going to be. But, you know, for maybe like a Cloud9 at the edge or something, it might be just barely... Them not making it or just barely making. Oh shit! Just barely making it. 
Um, and so I don't know. Uh, for for most of those teams, though, I think they can make a pretty educated guess. Okay. Well, uh, March fourth, something around, some, like something you, around that. Like if you look at it, like Phase Vitality, Spirit Mouse, G, up to G two, is probably pretty obvious. You know that they're going to be in the like skipping the first stage. Okay. All right. Well, we can talk more about that later. Let's uh, dive in. Uh, Lucas, are you ready with the Vox Pop by any chance, my friend? Oh my God, he's ready with the Vox Pop. Holy shit. Lucas on top of his game today. All right. Well, we uh, well, ask Just because question. it's Astralis, so you can't <laughs> wait to, to hear some, some of this, I think. Uh, we uh, we ask you uh, your question every week. Uh, the people at home on the Instagrams as well as the Twitter sphere or X, um, depending on how you want to frame the website. Call it whatever you want. Who cares? It's a place where we go and we talk. Uh, but the Vox Pop for this week is uh, questioning what caused Astralis' failure at the RMR? Uh, and the options that we gave you as part of the multiple choice were bad in-game leading, bad roles, bad individual form, or too much pressure. I saw people requesting an all of the above yeah. uh, option, <laughs> which we which we didn't supply. Now, um, Kixon, uh, whether whether you like it on or not, uh, because you're part of Heroic, you're kind of somewhat you know involved in the in the orbit of this drama because you've got Tessas and Shusha on your team, and you're in the Heroic team now. Uh, did did you get much when you joined from Tessas and Shush of them like talking shit about their old teammates and Astralis and stuff? Like, did you get brought into the drama or is it just something that exists and you're like, yeah, whatever, I don't give a fuck? I don't care too much what happened, but uh, to be honest, when I joined, I asked what really happened because there were so many stories online and you don't know who to trust. True. I just asked just so I know. And now I know what actually happened. And yeah. Oh, you want to spill the beans with us? I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to keep you on the spot here, mate. So those yeah. options that I just read out, uh, as as far as why the team uh, Astralis didn't perform, let me quote it again. What caused Astralis' failure at the RMR? You can only pick one. Let, let, I'm going to put you on the spot. You can only pick one of these four. Was it bad in-game leading, bad roles, bad individual form, or too much pressure? I can only pick one. If If, yeah. Well, you could weasel out of it, but also, I am trying obviously, to keep obviously, obviously, multiple choice, man. Obviously, all of them to some degree, but which one is like the most uh, problematic? Or maybe E, uh, tough, tough run. They played would, you guys after all. I would say the most important is the too much pressure thing. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. Oh, all right. Do we want to elaborate, Striker? I think just you could you could see it, man. Like you could see that they were fucking scared. They didn't even look devastated that they lost. Like they they did not want it. Like they wanted it, but they just did not look like it. They didn't it want to crazy. lose as opposed yeah, to wanting exactly. to win. That's how they looked. The counter strike like, classic. It all. <laughs> but it was yeah, I don't know. It was Strokes just rough watching because that, they're man. true. What what was rough about it? Did that they looked like dead inside? Everything, man. The way they played, the way that they looked after I mean, how they looked afterwards, you can like you don't, you're not making it to the major for the third consecutive time for the organization. Like it couldn't be worse in terms of like the impact of, of not making it, you know. But it's more like in game, just it felt like, like nobody was there. You had like there is the guy who was like basically put in most of the bad positions. I mean, he has some of the good ones, but most of the bad positions he's he has he's the anchor on CT side and he's fucking carrying them on ancient, like getting multi kills all the time. Um, when like in positions where he's not supposed to, he was the only guy, and you could even say, see it from. I mean, I put it out on Twitter, and I think a lot of people agree that you know he was the one who did the losing interview, and I think like part of the reason why he probably said yes or he offered himself to do it, if that's what happened, I don't know exactly the story, like why how it was decided who was going to do it, but I think it is partly because there is the by far the least pressure on him because of first. He played well. I think everybody saw that. I think he had nothing to be ashamed about in terms of his own performance. And second, he is the guy who's like 19 and he's, it's his, I don't know how many, second major or something like that. He's not expected to, he's not on the same level as the other four guys, right? So the pressure isn't on him necessarily. It's all, all, the, all, all on the other four, especially because all the other four had some sort of power in this team, you know? Those two stubby, that be whatever. I, I, I <laughs> you'll never, done it. you'll never fucking be able to get rid of this. By the way, like that, that, that's the crazy part about it. But Town in the Abbey just joined. Obviously, you know, making a massive fucking statement from joining from Heroic. Device and Blame F were the, were the power duo of the team, like dating back to when they first joined. You know, so like there is the guy who has zero pressure on him, and so I understand why he, um, he even looked 
not that devastated after, you know, getting out uh, of the RMR, you know, and why he played well. I think that was like the most telling of everything. That Stair was the one who did not look like he had the pressure on him, played well, and then did the losing interview as a champ, you know, like just did it well. Like to understand, like, I don't know. I don't get it, you know, well, what happened otherwise. But I think the that shows the most the part about the pressure playing the biggest factor in them being eliminated. Okay. Prof, are you buying this? Uh, you buying it? I don't know what, what's being you sold. He, he was just waffling. But no, well, no, he wasn't, he's, waffling. He's, he wasn't he's, waffling. He's, but he's but saying like, pressure. He's saying yeah, pressure was I the thing the pressure, and he was right. using the stare example of him being the one with the least amount of pressure and not being as phased, playing well, doing <sighs> interviews. So are you, are you buying the pressure argument? I mean, the pressure is definitely... Uh, aspect of it for sure and it didn't help like they kind of got themselves put into pressure by you know playing some good teams losing to them getting into a situation where it's like do or die time and then when it was they they kind of sank right they didn't really rise to the occasion and it, it kind of comes down to astralis being the same way and kind of scapegoating putting these like fifth players into losing interviews for the last like three four We're years back on the interviews and it's fucking crazy, but but because it shows, it shows the team character though. Like it does. Like look at any other big team when they get eliminated, it's gonna be the snappy, the care again. You know, the leader of the team that's gonna step up and say something, right? And how is this team through all of these iterations and different roster changes, like fucking pu putting Lucky in losing interviews? Like what the fuck does Lucky have to do with anything? He's just like dude here. <laughs> <laughs> not even opping like you bring in as an opper he's rifling you get destroyed in copenhagen who's going to do the interview no it's gonna it's gonna be lucky like for the bro doesn't even know anything about karoshai he's just he's just there he's just vibing you know what the fuck and it's kind of the same thing like someone needs to take responsibility in the server and out of the server and no one is doing it and they have like this coach that <laughs> you talked about which I, I didn't watch that much in Katowice. I didn't notice him. But now watching it, it just feels like, what is this guy doing here? It's just like this cute little kid. You want to just <laughs> to touch his little cheeks and be like, but he's not a coach. Like he's not adding anything to this lineup. Where's the, where's the backbone of fucking Astralis? It does not exist. It's disgusting, actually. It's actually disgusting to see that so, over and over again. Okay, so what and I you want all... to say just one, one more thing. Yeah? I could have, I could give them a pass for so many times in these like last two or three years always like oh glaive is completely out of form his calling is is bad like it was it was definitely at some point zip it was out of his, meta for sure zip zip was completely like washed like ah you can't provide like uh, the roles aren't really clashing but the, the roles are clashing right and then they come they make these huge signings which again don't solve the roles they are they again like just the, ignore it completely but okay, it's your decision. You invested so much. You have fucking sick players. Where's the excuse now for like players underperforming and being like being wishy-washy? Like, how is this not like inspiring you to play better and give like 110%? Instead, like we're giving like 60% of every player except Stair, who's like on drugs or something. Like fucking <laughs> he's not on drugs. By the way, guys. Out. <laughs> like he is he is doing amazing, right? Like what where are these four players? They they all sucked. They all sucked. Yabi sucked, device sucked, blame F sucked, especially and fucking who am I missing? Stone did not exist at all. Sucked, like, you could say it too. So okay. Is... So prof, you're you're speaking to something a little bit more systemic. Uh, as opposed to just the issues at the RMR, right? I mean, because there, has to, there has to be like the, the worst thing is there's only one, there's one, only one or two things tying this together, and one is like Astralis as an org, and even they they change like half of the people behind the team, and there's blame F. There, there's two only only two things. All right, and we can make out of that what we want. Let's let's dig deeper here, then, shall we? Now let's turn to our resident professional Counter Strike player for this evening's episode, Kicks. And when you look at Astralis's roster, does it look like it should work or does it look like it's missing elements to be a cohesive top team? I mean, on paper, if you look at the players, it should work, but there is, I feel like they're missing something or someone that will kind of sacrifice for the team. Ah, okay. Now let's try a little game here, guys. Let me list a player. Let me list a team and you tell me the player who sacrifices in this team. Here we go. Here's a nice little experiment that we're about to play. Phase okay. plan. 
Who sacrifices uh, in Kerrigan, that team? Kerrigan, Rain. Okay, cool. Uh, Kerrigan. Vitality. Who sacrifices in that team, guys? Apex, Apex. but also all the other players, I'd sure. say. Cool, okay. So Flames okay. as well. Yep, good, good. Um, G2, who sacrifices in that team? That's Hooksy. Easy. Okay, all right. Um, Navi, who's who sacrifices in that team? Uh... Honestly, I, d I don't know. I guess Probably Alexi. Alexi in jail. Yeah, yeah All I right. think so. All right. So as we tie in this common denominator together here, what do the players that we've just mentioned have in common? I, I don't Other like than the idea that the IGL has no, they to doesn't. be it doesn't, the, the but sacrificer we just listed, necessarily. We just listed but, yeah. teams that are somewhat successful. I mean, it wasn't in Heroic when Kadian was... No, but he's also an Orpa. Yeah. Same as Virtus Pro. Yeah. Right. James doesn't sacrifice, but he's an orpa playing a different role within the team. I think that we have a few things that we've established here this evening. One of which we've uh, gotten to the problem of Astralis, but well, one of which you know you guys listed the interview. So who should have taken the interview if not Stair? I mean, blame F secondary device. Okay. Those two guys have to go up. All right. Great. One and, of those two guys has to go up. And in a lot of successful teams at the moment, the in-game leader sacrifices. The in-game yeah. leader in Astralis does not sacrifice. The in-game leader it's in Astralis... The, it's the, the exact opposite for most of the time. The yeah. in-game leader in Astralis doesn't even try and win one-on-two situations. Yeah. Come I mean, on, let's, let's, let's stop. It's let's crazy. not beat around the bush. Like, no, we can't, we got to talk... Me, it's the fucking you know, elephant in the room. No, no, no. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy to me, and I mean, we also outlined it in the top twenty, right? Uh, b like the reason why Blamef was relatively low for the stats he had is because he is like by far the biggest rifler saver, rifler saver we have in the scene. That the top, like towards the top, and obviously no, Astralis have not don't succeeded talk about with it. that. People haven't been talking about this candidly at all. Oh, they have. Oh, what do you the mean? Pl like, the players the do, right? Uh, the the players will, when they're playing against him. They'll yell out, like, you know, they'll call him a beta right, right, while right. they're playing against him. But, bro, it's, not, it's the only thing that the community talks about. Like, this is, like, getting... It's, this is everywhere. Like, you cannot say that it's not being talked I about. Guess, I guess not from, like, I know, pro players and maybe even to some degree, like, analysts and casters have been right. giving him a pass to some... And he also earned it to, to some degree. Like, he was also more aggressive in some rounds, blah, blah, in different iterations of Astralis. I think there was, like, an up like a less baity blame F that we are seeing in certain times that gave people kind of the 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 leeway. People gave him the leeway, I would say. Um, but it's also like on the forums all the time, and it's also behind the scenes. The thing that most pros asked about and like shit on. They want to see the top eco 20. stats. Yes, but in terms of the top twenty, he was the player that people like. Yeah, but why is he here? Like, why do? How can this guy be, you know, above or below or in the top twenty when my teammate or me is not? Like, that's definitely it's definitely prevalent. I would say. But are we to, we we just highlighted two problems this evening. One of which, right? You've basically said, Prof, and I'm going to paraphrase here completely. I'm not even going. I'm not even going to be close. This is the sentiment I took. The team lacking the backbone to have the necessary components doing the interview and standing out there and being the front facing part of the team, right? Yeah, yeah, completely. Okay. Yeah. And then then we're talking about the player who is meant to be able to be the glue of the team to do that outside of the server and also sacrifice inside of the server so the other players believe in the system and everything, right? Yeah. The problem I mean, is part of it. But the problem I mean, is Blame F gets good numbers. That's the problem. He got okay numbers, but it's it's not the only problem. That's the thing. Like as, as like the vote said, you know, if you got all of the above, you would be able to take them literally all. Like the problem was with everything. And we saw even like in terms of like leadership, actual leadership, like the way that they played, like whatever, like how do you how do you have four top they, twenty players and you play four ones? They only beat and Nexus like, and you... Monty. Yeah, that's rough. And Monty had SDY who was sick. But you also have to look at the individual players, right? And the form was definitely a part of it. And you can blame it on whatever you want. You know, it can, can be the pressure that got to them. You know, they can't perform at the same level because they're too scared to to miss out on the major, or whatever. They put too much pressure on this to one single fucking tournament to even do anything. You know, so. Like that's all, that, of course that's part of it, and I don't want to put all the blame blame pa uh, on blame f exactly because like regardless of leadership, sometimes like you have players that should be able to make moves that win you rounds like on their own, you know. Sometimes you will just have those moments, and we didn't see that for pretty much the entire Darmar from from Astralis. 
not in the games that mattered. Like they just nobody was able to step up and do that. And they have four players who were in the top twenty last year, and it's like device suddenly is missing shots when he was a fucking beast last year, like when he was playing with the previous roster that wasn't supposed to do anything. Suddenly he's just missing shots everywhere. Like how is that how is that like that's not Blameth's fault. That is a fault of something else. Either it's device it, it, himself or it's the pressure that was put on the team for like for this tournament or whatever it is, you know. But that's not Blameth's fault. There's plenty of other things that you can point to and say they fucked up. Like team wise, they fucked up. It's not blame. Well, okay. Not just I, blame, at least. I just say. linked. I just linked the device tweet from during the tournament, right? Where he tweeted. Mm -hmm. I linked this to Lucas, so Lucas can bring this up if he wants. If not, it's all good. I just fucking read it. Doesn't matter. Device saying not having any fun playing whatsoever at the moment, which is seen on the performance. Really disappointed and sad. What do you guys take from that? If one it's of your players said it's that, Bunky kicks says in, that during the RMR, by the way. Yeah, kicks. And if one of your players said that mid tournament, what are you thinking? You think we're fucked? I mean, you you read this and you think they're out, and they weren't. Yeah, I'm not that big fan of this kind of tweets, especially during tournament that you're still playing. They were not out after this game. I think it was this tweet it was, was after even one two. No, I think it was this after was our game. game against them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. they still had. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. I think a few more right. chances to to qualify for the major. Yeah, this was the one two game or one 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 game. One one yes. one one game. This was yeah. so they literally had still two series to play at. At the tournament and, and then quality. and the last chance quality, and he writes this like that's crazy to me. Like the, I I understand like hundred percent if it's true I get it like I I respect the honesty, but imagine you're being like the teammate you know and like looking at this and it looks like you're defeated already, like it looks like you're out of the tournament. Yeah, but where does this come from? Because this sentiment is quite key, right? Like if you're playing a tournament and I'm not, it's not meant to be. Like, oh, we're having such a great time. Ha ha, we're losing. This is great. Right? That's that's obviously not it. You, you, you tell us, Chad. You tell us where it's coming from. Well, for me, the, I don't know. But the way I extrapolate something like this is the, the mood in the team is like too serious. Right? Like, obviously, it's serious. Right. There's pressure on and you want to qualify and everything like that. But you're going in like you're walking on eggshells. Right? Like, nobody wants to be the person, which then goes into the game where there's nothing worse when your players are scared to make a play. What you were talking about just before, striker, four players in the top 20, and you know somebody should be able to win around single-handedly. But that means that you need to, first of all, trust your teammates. You need to trust the system, what you're doing. You need to understand the strategies that are going on. And then within all of that, within that, that basis that's being set, then you can make your plays. Oh, shit, I'm here. This is happening. There's a smoke here. There's a flash. I can make my play. I can get two kills. I can get this multi-kill. When you're going into rounds and you're like, you're not dictating anything or you're, like I said, you're scared to make a mistake or everybody just fucking is so stressed that, that plays aren't being made and things aren't feeling good. You're never going to, you never, I'm you, just going to say, fucked. look, I'm just going to say one thing. Why do you think they almost beat Vitality twice in the blast groups and they shed the bat and buy him Karavica and the RMR? Stakes? Because nobody gives a fuck about the groups because there's no pressure at the groups. Everybody's like, whatever, we just take this as a as practice. And that's where Astralis actually looked good. And it looked like they didn't have the role problems that kind of everybody slightly expected with Blameth and Stone being a bit too similar of a player, you know, both of them being kind of on the Beatty side. Beatty side in the sense of like role, not like I'm not talking about like just saving all the time and stuff like that. You know, I'm just talking about him always like having somebody in front of them and being able to trade them and all that stuff, you know. And that's like Stone and Blameth, like both there, they, they might as well be the same player on some some of the positions on his side, you know, hmm. and at blast groups, it actually did not look like that was going to be the case. Like it looked like it worked from a role perspective. And suddenly they just go to Karavica, shit the bet, go to, don't go to Armar and just everything goes to shit. They don't look like top 20 players. Even they don't look like top 50 players. It was mid. It was worse than that. Kicks and how did we fix Astralis? Tell us. I'm not going to say it. Why would I say it? True. Like, that's, that's true. Why would you help the enemy? He's bang on. He's bang on. Why would you help the enemy? Asian, All right. Uh, maybe like enough. replace there uh, for... <laughs> um, I want to say coughing, but might not... Yeah. I don't know. Just say something. The, the worst what, idea ever. What about this? What about this? Here's, here's, uh, here's a question for the room. Uh, what was worse? G2 not qualifying for the major or uh, Astralis not qualifying for this major? It was Rio that uh, G2 didn't make, right? <sighs> I think it was worth G2 not qualifying. Really? Astral Astralis is already on a streak of not qualifying. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 I think that's fair. I think no, that's, that's actually true. true. Because G2 yeah. were actually like top five team at the time, top three or something. Nico, who is better than anyone on 
on Astralis right now. Yeah. Wow. And Monacy, right? I mean, they had Nico and Monacy, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Both better than anyone on Astralis right now. All right. Yeah. And, and it's also that, like right. at the time that they were just a better team that Astralis is now. Astralis is still new. They fucked they fucked it and kind of each side where we still weren't sure how it's a gonna home work. major. Like look from the expectation side and like from like how bad it is for the team, I'm like I'm sure it's Astralis, man. Right. Like especially because it's the third in a row, because like I was kind of doing the math and like just ballparking how much money they've lost. Just like from a business perspective as an org, you know, how bad this is for the org. You know, who's had some like rumors flying around about them having like some financial problems. Obviously, you know, they found some money to buy fucking Stown and Yabi for two million almost. Um, which by the way, you know, I heard that there was some uh, uh some clause about like them making the PGL major, you know, adding a little bit more to to Heroic's bank. Sorry, Heroic, you're not getting some money, I guess, from the from the transfer now. I think, uh, I think it was kind of I think it was part of the fairly, but it's I think it was minuscule though. I mean, like compared to the actual buyout, like it was somewhere in the area of like a hundred thousand or something. But anyway, like my point is like this probably cost these three majors probably cost Astralis somewhere in the area of like three, four million dollars, depending on how much like these next pickers make the make the teams. Like just from the last major alone, they lost like two million. You're thinking just from the org or the the org, org from stickers. Player. I mean, from stickers. Let's say let's Both. say players have fifty percent. Let's say players have fifty percent of the team sticker, which is fairly, fairly uh, a common these days. Like for it to be a 50-50 split for the team sticker, the be- the average that the teams got was like three and a half million from Paris alone. So let's say one point seventy five that the org lost from from Paris, and then Rio was a lot smaller. I, I don't know. It might have been like a million per team. So that's another half a million that they lost. And now imagine like. Um, the first um, what is the company major. first yeah. major like goes even half of what the Paris major does. That's another million gone. It's like four million across three majors that you just you don't have. You just lost. Like you, it doesn't it doesn't come. All right, all right, hold on. I got an idea of how to get something out of Kicks in here to solve this situation. All right, Kicks, and I want you. You're um you're you're working at Astralis right now, right? You're in you're in management, and you go you go to Ants. You go. Hello, Natu. And Natu opens the door and he goes, what's up, Astralis? And uh, you, you're like, hey, um, you've got this Danish in-game leader. We used to have him once upon a time, but we, we would like to buy him off you. How much would you be willing to pay Natu to buy Glaive? Can I tell you one secret? Yeah? He's never going back. <laughs> but you're trying to buy him. How much would you offer? Don't worry about Glaive's perspective. Mm. You're Astralis right now. How much would you offer to buy Glaive? I don't know. A million? Uh, he's w- worth a million? Maybe. I think yeah. so. And uh, you know, the funny part is, like, he went for free to Ants because his salary was so high that, like, Astralis just wanted him, wanted somebody else to pay his salary. That was a, basically it. He didn't even, they didn't, Benz didn't even pay a, pay a buyout for, for Glaive. Mm, yeah yeah jesus what a mess uh, i think just to just to finish the astralis thing you obviously played and beat astralis uh, a few times now uh recently how how did these games feel to you like what was the was the key to to beating astralis except having like super excited teammates <laughs> well uh, he's not gonna tell us that either, like, the, the last the last <laughs> the last one was just nurse dominating everyone no the, yeah, the Mirage honestly, game. You were I also think, sharp on that game. Everyone was hitting bangers. Yeah. I think we were just a better team individually. And also, I don't know why this second time they like they wanted to play Mirage again. We beat them the first time on Mirage. And now the second time they, they wanted to play it again. So we were like, it's fine. That's it. But also, I think uh, we, we know how to play under pressure much better than them, which <laughs> we proved pretty and clear. they proved. Yeah. yeah. So I think these two things were the most key. Like most Mirage important. is your map at the moment. You guys are like eight and one on it. Yeah. It's like the heroic map. It's like, well, I'm it's, having a look. Yeah. It's Macedonian map. Yeah, okay. Macedonian home ground. It was always Blue's best map. We can check stats. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Bringing a bit of the uh, Macedonian flavor to heroic. All right, all right. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's jump forward from our Astralis conversation because um, we could be here all night. 20 minutes uh, is enough. I feel like we satisfied the viewers hopefully. 20 minutes of Astralis. Hopefully, hopefully. I feel like well, I'm still pissed off, like even in like what is it, whatever it is, three days after they've they've been eliminated. I feel like it's so crazy. How I do you think they agree, feel? I have to agree because like even when this roster came together, I was I was a 
I was a, I was a hater. I didn't believe in the the roles that there was going to work. And instead of being like happy that I can gloat that they failed, I, I'm still mad because I feel like it's like not, they just they have to do better. Like it's it insane. Has to, yes, yes. And it's also like it's just a shame overall for them not to be there. And I guess Falcons is next on the list also for like Snappy and Zonic and Zonic and Magic especially to not even get to the group stage of the of the Copenhagen Major. Uh, it's a huge fucking shame. Do we start with Boros being replaced immediately or do we oh. do we start with like because man, after their performances and then people were tweeting at me because I like I retweeted some question of like, you know, what are the chances that Boros is on the team after the major? And I retweeted like no chance or whatever. I think it's maybe after Katowice. And people were like, he's the highest rated player. Like he's got the best stats. His stats are fine. I'm sitting there just thinking that's got nothing to do with if the rest of the team actually enjoys playing with him or not. Like it has to be a cohesive unit of a team, which it clearly wasn't. They clearly didn't enjoy playing with him. That was very, very clear. So Boros is gone already. Um, and like we've already seen a bunch of ramifications. I'm sure we'll get to them as we talk through other RMR teams, like um, the Inner Shine situation, and there's a few other ones that are uh, fallouts of of the R of RMR lack of qualification. But for Falcons, uh, let me just bring it up here so we can take a look at uh, their run. I'm just gonna fucking click through a couple a little this and that, and then click this one and that one. And so it's win against 3D Max 13-8. That's a start. Then yep. it was the phase 13-7. Uh, Lose to Eternal Fire, uh, 13-5, and then 1-2 against the Amcal. Amcal. So they win Vertigo, yeah. uh, the opponent's map pick, and then they get kind of nothing on Ancient T-side. Uh, and then Mirage goes to overtime, and they and they lose. I don't think I caught the end of this game, to be honest. I think the Amcal game, I remember watching the third map where it went OT. Um, but... If you if you can't beat Amcal, you're probably not qualifying for the major. Either. They obviously didn't have the easiest of of runs with the teams that you had just listed there, Prof. That they went up against, right? Um, but at, at the same time, yeah, the only team they beat was 3D Max. So losing to Phase and Eternal Fire, that's actually pretty reasonable losses. Like Phase and Eternal Fire, I think are both pretty good teams. Like I think they're I think, they're, goes I the think they're still. I think I mean Eternal Fire, they're still favorites, right? Uh, yes. I mean, you can put it down to 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 one map. You know, obviously, you know. Sure. But it's not like that was a close game either. So that's also a bit of a problem. Like this was the easier of the two groups as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like losing. I mean, to there's just Amcal. there's just no no excusing the the loss to Amcal, yeah. yeah. But they they have the the entropic core, right? So Forrester Crad and uh Nickelback. Nickelback. And then yeah. yeah, Icy was um I don't know if he's a revelation. People were talking about him as an opera, and then Travis was just fine. Um but they, they all had their moments. I mean, I, I kind of like the Umcal team just because like, yeah, I was also looking at Icy just because he was like the most, not the most hyped. He was kind of like a hipster pick, you know, for, for fantasy. Like, you know, it's, he was like a guy who you might throw a punt on if he's not like, I don't know, he was kind of expensive for for being uh, a risk, you know. Uh, but I was like looking out for him just because I was curious. I didn't actually pick him for my fantasy. I wasn't biased in the end. Um, but he had some moments, but he just like, you know, classic kind of up and down, not, not exactly a experienced guy, you know, so. Uh, but I was impressed with him anyway. Well, did Falcons have more or less time than your team kicks in? What 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 was there? When did Falcons come together fully? Was it about the same uh, time? I think it was around the same time. Do you reckon they were practicing on the 26th of December? <laughs> I have no idea. I think Probably that, yeah. after they, got the, they got the core, remember? Like they had a bit more space because they didn't have to play the open calls. They got straight That's straight right. invites to, yeah. to the RMR. So. I think they had more time than us, definitely. And I'm not sure... I Think they were not at Blast as well? Uh, they no, were. They're at Blast. Yeah, they bought a spot. They paid for. Oh, they a were. Spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. my bet. But no, they had good. more time than us, definitely, because we had to play the open and the close quality. Yeah, yeah I don't. I just feel like for them, it's a different kettle of fish than than your team, because there's so many rosters that have came come together over that period of time, right? So for your team, we, as I was mentioning before, it felt like everybody on your team is hungry with something to prove, and obviously, I think that's the case for the guys on Falcons in terms of wanting to prove something because a lot of them have just made a move to an organization that comes with um, a lot of negativity around it. But there's always the, there was always this, um, oh, Ella, I'll use elephant in the room again of, of the Boros situation. Like, how was he going to be? He's, and they didn't even, the thing is they don't really even, well, they didn't use him in all the star player roles, which I, it just, I don't know. It kind of made the complexion of the team seem a little bit off. I know. I, I wonder what happens now. With I know Simple's only in there for the showdown. 
I don't even know. I don't expect that to be a long-term thing. I, I don't even know what to make of this Falcon situation. It, it, I think it's a lot more expected for them not to make it than Astralis. I feel like Astralis should have made it. Falcons, I don't know, easier group. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think the Falcons should have made it? Start with Kickstarter. Kickstarter, do you think they should have made it? I think they should have made it because if you look at the players and uh, I think if you just look at the players, you expect these players to qualify. And I think as you already mentioned, they were in kind of the easier group. I think it was expected for them to qualify. Okay. I think, uh, um, I don't know. I think maybe people got a little bit um, misled by the fact that they made it to the, the Katowice playoffs. To the Katowice playoffs because like, remember how it started? Like they almost got eliminated by Rebels. Like they could have gone out last of yes. Karavica if they didn't get their Boris basically if they did if he didn't like get them out of trouble against the against rebels you know they would have just gone out in last place and they ended up going to the to the playoffs you know to the semi even where they lost the spirit right so I think maybe people were a little bit misled by that and for, forgot the fact that they were shaky to start the tournament you know and so maybe the expectations were a little bit too high but still I mean this is a team that obviously got a lot of money pumped into it uh, just for buying the ends not even buying the end score because Snappy went for free, Madden went for free. I think those two contracts were for nothing, but uh, uh, Magisk as well, I think. But Sampai is, I think, cost quite a bit of money. And then you have the whole Zonic, Lars Robol, who I'm sure were also very well compensated and all that stuff, you know. They meant so, the bigger heads, right? So, yeah. I mean, just I mean, from like the expectation perspective, like I understand why people um, took it as a hard hard hit to Falcons, but I do think that it is early for them. Like it is, we all knew that this might not be the lineup that will make it through this major cycle, you know? So regardless of if they made it or not, there was a very good chance that they would just jump at the next opportunity to, to buy somebody big because they weren't able to in this cycle, you know, because this was kind of like their plan B or even plan C, you know, in terms of some of the players that they got. So uh, I think, I don't know, for me, I think I expected way more from Astralis, even if, Maybe it doesn't match the what they sh what the teams showed, you know, in the past couple of months. Mm. Yeah, as in someone in chat said, the making the Kato playoffs was detrimental to them, and uh, that's actually kind of true because it took away practice time. Right, they had to stick around for longer. They had also the RMR A. So, like in terms of practice time, it wasn't that much time um, for the team, and also realistically, the, the roles. We're also clashing a bit and this kind of ties into the striker thing this is kind of a makeshift roster like it wasn't compared to astralis who went out and just bought exactly who they wanted um you knew the falcons was like kind of scrapping for what they could get and they managed to get the super late we also know that they started practicing with like mhl and uh yeah longs i think yeah. Yeah, yeah right so this was like kind of a put together what you can put together kind of a situation and uh yeah we can also see that boris definitely did not live up to to the promise right of, of what he was supposed to do in terms of making like a lot of mistakes not really adapting to the level as quickly as the rest of the team wants him to essentially so mm. i think that's what gives us a lot more like leeway to this project versus versus uh astralis that had an igl had an op has been like struggling for a while finding the pieces and i went out bought what they wanted bought what they wanted and also had a lot more time because stavi and yeah um stone and yabi came in a bit before um, and, and they also missed three two majors already and it's in denmark so th th their expectations and were, it was just a different situation i think for for falcons that being said still a huge disappointment and also if Astralis didn't crash out, uh, the Falcons' failure would be the biggest talking point sure. of, the, of the RMR. They just got overshadowed by, by Astralis. Astralis. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Kixon, I, I, kind of it feels like to me, after this major, there's going to be another big set of roster moves. Right? Is that the the feeling from players? Like, Do you have that general thought that maybe after this next roster, there'll be another big shift of, of, of players again? Yeah, I think so. I think... I don't know, the last year or something, there are so many changes because most of the teams are international now mm. and it's easy for everyone to just get whoever they want. And I feel like it's it's happening a lot nowadays that you just see some transfer that a few years ago you, you wouldn't think they're possible. 
do, do you kind of expect something like that to happen. Do you think it's going to be regular or do you think it's just because of like where the majors placed and CS2 and everything like that at the moment? Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't. Do, do you think it's going to be like a, a regular thing where after majors teams just do this all the time? Or do you think it's just because we're in like a special period of time right now where CS2 is still relatively new and then we had this big shift of players in the lead up to this major and it doesn't, because to me it doesn't feel like it feels like there's a bunch of teams that aren't like complete or didn't necessarily get all the players that maybe they they'd wanted, and that's why this will happen again. I think it's kind of both, but it's it's especially happening a lot after the majors, because everyone's goal is to be at the major or for some teams even win it. Mm. I think that's when the most of the changes changes are happening. Okay. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how many more times it happens, right? Because obviously the second major this year is at the end of the season. And then with after the Shanghai major, the only time to make those changes, well, actually, we don't know what the new circuit and everything is going to look like in 2025 just yet. Hopefully we get some news from Valve sometime this year so we can start having those conversations and projecting what's going to what's gonna go down. Um, all right, let's jump into talking a bit more about some of the teams who didn't quite make it. Uh, so Profs put NIP, Monty, and Gamer Legion here together. Any Any reason for that, Prof? Any reason you've linked those three names? I feel like, uh, I guess Fnatic maybe to some degree could have also been in that category. I think it's like, I think Monty and Gamer Legion are teams just like Apex was that broke out last major, right? So sure. would be, I Into would the say bridge, kind you of, didn't put them here. I didn't, I didn't put them there. I didn't put them there. And <laughs> do, do you want to put them there? No, no, I at think all. It's but you put an IP here, so they're they're in a different kind of category completely. Um, I think that both teams have had pretty good chances to to make it to the major and also kind of have had breakout performances. And then it's NIP and Fnatic. I would say Fnatic like kind of rebuilt their lineup, but didn't really inspire any confidence. And NIP that's just gonna go now doing the same thing, right? Um, but we can actually just talk to talk about any team we we think is most yeah. interesting. I think for Monty it's pretty pretty well, big the shame. The SDY situation sucks for them, but they didn't play inspiring Counter Strike in Katowice, and they didn't play inspiring yeah. Counter Strike again. They were just kind of playing standard. It didn't feel like they were setting a tempo or a tone. Same kind of thing as Astralis, just like not with the same level of expectation by any means. Like hmm. I watched Monty play, and I'm like, the Anubis T side that I casted was probably one of the best things that they have played. Otherwise, it was all just pretty much like they're not fighting for territory. Maybe that was part of their game plan. Maybe they didn't have the spawns for. I don't know exactly. It just felt pretty flat from them. I wasn't. I wasn't overly impressed. I would. I want to say this about NIP though. We've been. Um, what's a good word for it? We've been critical of NIP over the last couple of years, and I think it's been reasonable that we've been critical. I think the same with me and Fnatic. And I think the same to some degree of Astralis. And they all stem from the same sticking points, management. Why, if you're NIP, are you keeping any players on that roster? Why is anybody safe? Why are you keeping anybody? I, 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 would, I would love to hear the explanation because the major is about to end in, what, six weeks or something like that, maybe less now. Why keep any of them? None of them deserve to stay on that team. None of them. Why keep any of them? Someone says res makes sense. I would, I would love to. I would love, I would love you to explain how res makes sense. Res has been on N NIP since 2017. NIP haven't done anything of note in like four years. The same with Fnatic. The same with OG. These teams are, are run by people who don't know what they're doing, guys. They're run by people who have no idea what they are doing. If that is not clear by the players and the results that are happening with these teams, I don't know what is. And if you're going to talk about wanting to find results by 2025, which is not, I'm not going to conflate it in the same way a lot of people at home do. Why are you keeping anybody from the current roster? Let the major end, look at what's available, get some people who understand Counter-Strike and build a brand new roster without any baggage. Please stop patchwork. Stop. I Stop. mean, isn't that kind of what they're doing? They just decided... They, Prof, they decided, you're the liaison to Sweden. Fix this, please. Okay, they just decided that Rez is still good enough to be on, on a lineup. That's, what, that's their judgment call, right? And that tells me, Prof, again, they don't know what they're doing. 
But isn't uh, isn't it great? Are you watching? Are you reading chat? People are, you know, the classic. Every time Rez is mentioned, it's like I am Oakland 2017 <laughs> MVP. MVP. <laughs> but now people are just spamming like random numbers, uh, random years. 1987 MVP, <laughs> 1970, 87 I am Oakland MVP. Just like making it so much worse. I love it. Very, Look, I think I think to to play devil's out <clears throat> to play devil's advocate at least in terms of Alex, uh, I I actually agree with you in terms of Rez. I, I think it's like okay. It hasn't worked for seven years. What makes you think it will now? Um, with Alex, I mean, they just—they only, literally only just got him, and they got him into a lineup that was clearly not going care. to work. I don't care. You I don't think care? Alex is actually a plus for attracting other players. It's better to have some IGL than none. Maybe. Like, yeah. Maybe. I, I think, think also we also have to consider like, okay, unless you're willing to splash a lot of money, I think to get five players would be hard. Just go back to the like drawing board, though, guys. Just, just, just level it all. Realize what your identity is, Swedish Counter Strike, and go back and build it from the ground up. Start again. Start again completely. Stop trying to compete with the best orgs in the world who in Counter Strike, like Phase and Vitality, because you're not as interesting. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to play for you. Go back to the roots. Re-establish yourself in Sweden. Swallow humble pie for a couple of years while you build back up the ranks, and then find success and do it the long, hard way. Don't here's do it. A, don't do it this way. Here's a question for Kickstand though. Who are who is a tier three player that people are not talking about that like a team like an IP should should look into or, or a player or two? Tier three player, like someone that's not you know on the that wasn't at the He's RMR. Not playing that, at the big events. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I haven't watched a lot of lower tier CS, but I can recommend some Macedonian. Tears. <laughs> Here we go. Sell they some of your be, boys, man. Get some friends. They might be even too. better than the current team. So, there yeah, but go. I think there's, yeah, I think there's uh, one good player from Macedonia, Eight Kit. I think he's been good okay. with the op. He was part of the ex Blue Jays uh, core, and I think he was, he was good back then, and he's still playing at a pretty good level. But he hasn't gotten the chance. So, if they want a good opper, they have one now. All right. It's got the kicks and seal of approval. Well, the, the problem is at the moment, kicks is when we're talking about a lot of these teams, right? Who who didn't make the major, right? We're talking about it from our our perspective as people who aren't like going up against these guys in practice and having the inside knowledge that you have. So when you see all the teams that didn't make the major, which from the like which ones stand out the most to you? Is like, oh shit, that's like really surprising. We thought they were good in prac, or this team, you know, should have had a good roster to make it. Are there any names that specifically stick out to you, like? Oh fuck! I can't believe they didn't make it. Mm, I would say Astralis. Okay. Maybe it's obvious one, but I feel like they have they did a lot of changes in the last I don't know year or something. They changed the roster a lot of times. So many players. I think they even changed coach. They changed everything, and they still didn't make it. Like if you look at the names on the roster, you should make the major ten out of ten times. I think. What about Gamer Legion? Do you think they play good enough Counter Strike to make it? Or oh, well, they obviously didn't. But were you surprising to not see them? Because one of the conversations that we have on this side of the fence is the structure and the way the team approaches the game is good, but they lack firepower. How do you look at Game of Legion? I think they played pretty good. They were just a bit unlucky, I would say. And I think it's a bit surprising to me that they're not at the major because I think they also did a lot of changes. I mean, they were kind of forced to because teams are buying their players. But I still think they, they've they been pretty good even after the Major. Like, obviously not at the level of the Major, but I still still think they're good enough to play on Majors. Okay. Yeah. I mean, their run was also like lost to Vitality, lost to Ents 16-14, and then lost to you guys in Heroic. Yeah. And and then they went to the last chance. Lost and to they... Nine Pandas. Yeah, beat Fnatic, built, beat Guild Eagles, and lost to Nine Pandas in like a super, super tight game uh, on Nuke, which is yeah a pretty long affair. But um, so I think, in a way, they they did they did pretty well, but they're not on the major. That's kind of the the situation. Yeah. it's not like a completely. It, yeah, it it is what it is. They they actually kind of had a similar run to Astralis if you look at it, uh, but. They are gamer legion with the lineup that we don't have that much faith in, right? So that's uh, the that's the we difference. think that they're traditionally just, punching above their weight. I was gonna yeah. say, like, I have to say, I was pretty disappointed that they didn't make it, even though I knew that they were gonna be somewhere on the edge of either yes or no. Uh, just because but I to think, lose to nine pandas is fucking wild, but the fact that I mean, Stralis lost to nine pandas that's the problem. is insane. Yeah, I mean, 
the fact that Nine Pandas did it by beating the two best teams in the LCQ, at least on paper, you know, you can make a, an argument that the Straws did not play like a, the best the highest ranked team at the turn like in the LCQ, you know, or even during the whole RMR basically. Um, but I mean that's pretty legit. They beat Astralis, they beat Game Religion. Like nobody can take it away from them and say it's just because they skipped got to skip like one series in the in the second day, you know, because they did play they played two very legit teams to qualify. So from that perspective, I mean I kind of get it. Um and glowing had a fucking life game. Like that's that was a that was a really good performance. Glowing, yeah, the 30 year old. The Fucking 30 year old's nuts. talent. You know what's that, funny, actually? We didn't actually release this because I think he took it back because, like, we have the bold prediction for, um, for top 20s, right? Every year. Uh, and guess that you're not going to guess who. Uh, but uh, K Serato picked Glowing as, like, his trio, like, in his trio of, like, bold predictions for, for his uh, top 20 this year. And his which trio was of bold a predictions. 30 year old, a 30 year old bold prediction is <laughs> that, that, that is the first, man. I <laughs> could say that. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Like, I he he was playing some phenomenal Counter Strike. But he was uh, great. Yeah, it was fantastic. Sure. I like, don't know. I don't remember the last time I saw a player top frag by this margin on three maps in a yes. series back to back. I don't remember. Like, it was kind of impossible. I was watching. I was like watching bits and bits of the map, and like, okay, he's like twenty four twelve. I'm like, okay, cool. Second map, twenty five eleven. I'm like, okay, this is kind of weird. Watching the third map, I'm like. Are these stats correct? Like he can't be 25, 12 again. No, he is. He is again. Like it's fucking, fucking insane. Like he played with uh, so much confidence. I don't know where it came from, but he he was just insane. And the worst thing is they almost lost. And they feel like one of these teams that are almost they're they're pretty good fundamentals and everything, but they have this like crumble factor to them. Um, and that clutch from C's, not C's, from Snacks, the 1v2 on Nuke mm. that almost pushed it to overtime, that he had no right to win. He's like, barely got one kill. The other guy was hiding, throws down a smoke. The guy is not showing. And then he spams through the smoke, kills the guy, last second defuse. It's like 99% of players would kind of give up mentally. And this is like, ah, oh, nothing's happening. He's not showing. He spams through a fucking smoke and just gets the guy. It's like, okay. Was a pretty really? like that? There was something that there was a general sentiment that um, the last chance qualifier essentially ruined the hype of the two two matches that we had, which is, I think is true. Like the two two matches, it, yeah, yeah it definitely they... took some of the sting out of it. I think is the way Harry phrased it. Maybe it was Demps. I'm not sure. One of the two of them was framing yeah. it that way. Yeah, Kinda I mean sucked. that's true. Uh, it's, it doesn't have the same impact. Also, because like yeah, from us like a storyline perspective, like you kind of want to say they basically eliminated, but they're not eliminated because they can still make it through. You know, so it's kind yeah. of um, it's obviously a bad, oh, it, but it it's just, hard to put that into words as much as okay, they're actually eliminated. It just like meant as a cast, he didn't have to put as much um, jam on the on the on the hot dog, mate, because you could just you just be like, and this team jam makes on it. the hot dog. Yeah, you know, you know me, you know, you screwed. Yeah, I got some funny sayings, um, but you didn't have to worry about going like with the really negative storyline of a team getting eliminated and stuff because it was never going to be a worry. It was just, this yeah. team's qualify, you know? It's all you had to run with. But I you wanted... could see, to be fair though, like from the emotional side, you could see like the teams that did lose those two, three matches, like they were fucking devastated as if they didn't make it because they knew it was going to be a hard fucking be, yeah, way yeah. back. Even if it didn't exactly mean that, I mean, nine pandas looked like they were just eliminated. Like they don't even have a chance. Some teams were even like, I saw some tweets that kind of suggested as if they didn't even know that they weren't eliminated, you know, that they still had another chance. So, uh, like, it still dawned on these people that, like, it was funnily enough, Nine Pandas were probably the one, the team with the worst response that I saw, you know, to, yeah. to losing that 2 too much to President Understandably Ampel. so. Yeah. It, understandably so that they and had they fucking a, make it back. Yeah, right? I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to ask proper question, then I want to pivot, and I've got, to, I want to get some power rankings from Kixon about who he thinks the best teams in the world are right now. Prof, I don't know if you yeah. kn you knew this. It was fucking crazy. Like I, I hope that you were paying attention to Reddit and Twitter and all of those things. But did you know that the RMR is the most important tournament in the year? <laughs> what a revelation yeah. that was that we learned on social media <laughs> the, the last week. Did you know that? That's kind of cr so crazy. How I these, couldn't believe how, to learn how that. How these ideas just pop up there and then are suddenly it's like oh everyone just realizes that we've been saying this at least for a year, probably for more. Um, that it is it is so important because it literally decides 
all of the sticker money. Like if you go through, you 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 win a million dollars, essentially, not literally, but your org is is gaining a significant ch chunk of change that is uncomparable to anything else. Even winning a grand slam is just like that's just for one team, you know. This is like tens of millions distributed based on this one tournament. It, it got me thinking, at least though, because I was like, when I saw the that as the center, I was like, yeah, that's we've been discussing that for a while now. But other than that, I just thought about it more, and I went, okay. It is the most important tournament to the players it, and well. the orgs. It's yeah, not both. the most important tournament to the viewer by any stretch of the imagination. Well, it's not. I mean, not the most important as if like it obviously doesn't mean more than the major to than the actual major, you know, to, but the, it's, to the but viewers. But it's not important to the viewer. The, the viewer, the viewer like is going to tune in and they're going to see and they're going to be interested. It's not the most important thing to the viewer. It's only the most important thing to the player and the org. Which right. doesn't necessarily make it the most important thing to the viewer. I mean, it's not. Be, considering the the numbers that like the streams got like this this time around, I think it's pretty clear that it means a lot to the audience as well, and like they really want to see yeah, how these things do already. The most like, important I, thing is winning the major. Like obviously, I understand, but it's also mm. for the players and it's also for the orgs. You know, like of course, like they would rather be a major winner than just than just qualify for the major. Like it is more important, but like the first step obviously is where it starts. You know, so that's why. Like it encapsulates the entire major. That's why it's the most important. Yeah. So it's not about like the RMR itself being the most important, but it's like about the whole thing. That's how they get into it, you know. But the RMRs is where hardcores tune in. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, if you have like, bro, we had like a half a million peak on like some of these. No, uh, I know some it's of good, these matches. But like, okay, oh, not exclusively the hardcore, but this where the people who are interested to see how the whole campaign goes. Most people are tuning in because they want to see who the wins the world championship. And I'm not detracting from like. Um, the stickers or anything like that. Like people are right. obviously interested in that and they want to support their team and stuff. And and as we've highlighted on this show several times before, the RMR to the player and the org is the most important because it can financially stabilize them to keep doing what they're doing for the next yeah. year, half a year, whatever yeah, it is, yeah. which is huge, right? And I see the conversation about like, oh, maybe we should scale sticker money and this, that, and the other. And if you ask me, okay, do I want the best team to win more or would I prefer for the entire professional Counter-Strike scene, well, not the entire, would I prefer 24 times five slash six plus a little bit of org to be financially stable or financially making money, which, which would I prefer? I'd prefer for 24 times five to be able to make a living and play professional Counter-Strike in right. a year, yeah. right? I was, Do, thinking, I was thinking about this actually as well because I had like this thought, you know, and it's like you're almost, you almost have to catch your bullshit when you think about these things just because like obviously like the way you start thinking about this is like, okay, we can't have the RMR be the most important thing. We have to have the major yeah. be the most most important thing. And the way you like the logical way to make the major be the most important thing would be to scale the prize money with this kind of money that the sticker money has, you know. But then you become Dota and we all know that we don't want that because then it becomes yeah. only about who wins the major. One event. Yeah. Only about who wins the major, who gets top two, top four. Those four teams get all of the money or most yeah. of the money, you know? And you don't want that because like then it becomes only about that. And One so like, it year. makes yep. much more sense for it to be spread out. I like this way more. I still am not happy There's about... There's the championship capsule, though, for the team who comes of first. Of course, of course. I mean, I still am not happy about the fact that like the RMRs have become such a fucking massive thing compared to the Major itself, uh, just because like you can tell that teams are making decisions. Like, for Purely example, you know, the, Ants, the Ants move, you yep. know, that they got the, the trio from nine. I would, I would hazard a guess they would never fucking do that if it wasn't for the RMR slot like there was yep. never there was that was never going to happen without them having the rmr slot you know obviously it worked out for them it actually ended up being a good call the lineup actually looks much more competitive than we initially thought glaive is making it work somehow all that stuff like obviously hindsight worked out great but there's no way that would have happened without the rmr and just making these moves just to skip a couple of qualifying stages i don't like that because i would rather teams actually make the moves that they want you know that they that they want long term that they think yeah. will be the most competitive down the line not just short term like this is the major and this is where we want to get to right now and we will deal with the fallout of like if we get to the major with this lineup and we will we will deal with that later you know i don't like that uh that part of it but i would still much rather have this than have all the prize money at the major and then uh become the ti at dota you know twice a year what do you make of it kicks as a player uh I kind of agree with you both. I think uh, you're talking for so long, I even forgot. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, but I think uh, it shouldn't be like that, that the RMR is the most important tournament. 
But uh, I kind of understand what uh, Striker said when he said that it's just the beginning of the whole major cycle. Oh, yeah. Would, would you pref- like, because obviously for somebody who gets to benefit from this system, right? When you qualify, like you don't know exactly how much money you're going to make, right? Like nobody knows how much money yeah. you're going to make. The last one was a little bit of, um, I don't even want to call it an outlier, but the last one has set this like expectation that might not even be obtainable again. We don't know. Valve left those stickers on sale for a very long time, um, which I'm sure you as a player were like, yeah, fuck you, yeah, Valve, keep those things on sale, man, keep it going. But do you, when you qualify, are you thinking, what, what's what's the first thing going through your head? Is it, fuck yeah, I've just secured a couple of hundred thousand dollars or it's, fuck yeah, I get to play the major? Or are they combined? I think they're both combined. Like, uh, I think nobody would say, you know, I don't care about the money because it's not a little amount of money. So I think for all the players, wealth, both, mate, it's fucking crazy. For all the players, both of the things are important. Yeah. Obviously, playing at major is something that you always dream of, but also, you know, earning this money through CS, something that you you wanted to do your whole life, it's also something very important, I would say. Well, you went to your first major and made it straight into the top eight. So you did all the fun things in one major. You yeah. qualified, you got all the money, and you got the trophy in game. Mate, I played four majors. I wasn't even close to that fucking trophy at all. That's all I wanted. All I wanted was that little trophy. Yeah, I'm the first sad. major was like a dream. Yeah. Hey. And now you got to go do it again. And you qualified the whole way through this time as well. So you've done it the hard way again. I can only yeah. imagine that must feel like, fuck yeah. Like, was each stage like relief when you went through like each, like, you know, open into closed into this? Yeah, it was uh, like, I think every, like every part of the process, like the open quality and the closed and then the armor, like every time we qualified for the next one was a huge relief. Which Even the open the quality. I mean, obviously the RMR was the hardest, but even the open quality was huge relief when we got it. That's online CS for you. Yeah. <laughs> playing like 10 hours without any breaks, then the next day playing some other best of trees. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, right? The games are a lot more uh, relentless when you're talking about the online stuff. It just doesn't seem to stop. All right. I prefaced it this before. I want to get into this now. So the landscape of Counter-Strike teams, I think, is pretty all over the place, right? Like off of Katowice, most people would go, oh yeah, Spirit's the best team, donk, 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 donk. Before the year started, most people would have been saying Vitality was the number one team. I think um, there's probably an argument to put FaZe still in the conversation because of their consistency of, of going deep within tournaments. Of course. If, if you had the power rank teams right now, Kixon, who are you putting as your top? Oh, let's go top five. Is it like current form or like Yeah, current, past- current form. Like right now, who do you think, like, are the top five teams in the world because right your your perspective on this is a lot more rooted in like we mentioned the the tournaments and the practice and you get to go up against these guys and see who hits harder and you'll know if they had an off day on a tournament or whatever yeah i think right now i would definitely say that spirit is top one okay and not uh it's not based only on uh officials but also on tracks okay we're playing some <laughs> insane cs uh second Second and third is between Vitality and FaZe, I would say. I'm not sure which one to put as second and which one as third, but I think they're pretty close right now. Okay. Fourth, uh, G2. Really? Okay, so you're still putting G2 up that high? Okay. Yeah, I mean, they did pretty good in... uh, They're good at the RMR. They beat you guys twice, right? Yeah, Yeah, and also they did uh, 3-0 at RMR, so I think they've been playing pretty good recently. If maybe mouse. Okay. All right. Interesting. I guess this is the thing. So what I, when I look at Vitality at the moment and I watch them play, sometimes they look like they can have like really good, so certain maps they look very comprehensive and put together. On other maps, it doesn't look like everything tends to make sense. Like, do you, so I, don't, I don't know where I want to go with this question, but for you to still rank Vitality highly, with the Counter-Strike they've played to start this year, it's been... I would say not the most convincing. So what is it that you you like about Vitality that makes them such a strong team? I think the fact that they've been, they've been uh, let's say, top three or something like that for a long time. So they've been around the top for a long time. I think that makes me put them like in top three at least. Because I agree that right now they don't look like the old Vitality, but I still think they have like... So they have top players who can win events at any time. Like even if they're playing 
that's a pretty bad deck and suddenly surprise and win any event, I would say. Okay. I want to put this question out to the room. What do we make of the conversation around Vitality? I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement. The team overall isn't that experienced. You're saying mm -hmm. Vitality as a team isn't that experienced? Overall. With all of its parts put together. I think that's... Uh, that's a stretch. But Flamesy and Mezzi, do you think they're hugely experienced individuals? I mean, it's not like Mezzi is inexperienced. You can't really say that. Uh, same thing. Like but at in this top Counter-Strike, is Mezzi that experienced? Yeah, but like what team has like five, apart from like FaZe, has like five, maybe now maybe G2. No, not even G2 because Hooksy also doesn't have like that much experience. Monesty doesn't have like mega levels of experience or whatever. Um, like it's basically like FaZe, the only team you can make, and make a case for having shitloads of experience. Okay. All right. So it's like... Vitality is definitely like among the more experienced ones if you look at the top scene at the moment. Like you look at, okay, Spirit, not even close. Mao's not even close. G2 would say less, maybe, or in the similar level. Um, you think Navi, G2 would have even, less? No, no, no. Navi's, the G2 probably similar similar level if you compare like whole, the whole team together, probably a bit more. Uh, Navi, not even close. VP, not even close. Falcons. G2 who would have heaps more, bro. It's not even close. Well, I mean... G2's not even close in the conversation. Flamesy, Flamesy and Mezzi, what, what have they played in? What oh, yeah, but have... Monacy played in. What does Nexa played in? Lexa's Monacy's around played for... in two ca uh, two Katowice Grand Finals, and he's won a Cologne. I mean, yeah, if you I look mean, at like very Sphinx deep, one, like I don't know what. Yeah, I didn't say Sphinx, Flamesy, and Mezzi. It depends on what you're talking about. I mean, Flamesy's also now played in like four, five finals or something. Like, it's not like he's inexperienced. He doesn't know what this like what this is like. You know, so all like all. But anyway, my point was like, if you look at the top ten teams, you'll find like two teams that are more experienced than them. You know. Yeah, I just don't know. I just look at the team and I'm really shaky on it. Like I look at the roles when they're playing some maps and I'm not sold. And then I look at like who's going to make plays to bail them out. Flamesy feels neutered. I think Mezzi's still stuck in like fucking in-game leader brain and playing anchor positions where he's not being selfish enough. And then like unless Zywoo is killing everybody, I'm like, what? what's going on? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think I feel Spinks like has the space. He might have the space. I don't know if he's he's got the aggression. Used to be there. I don't know, man. I don't. I'm not for whatever reason. I'm really just like I've. I'm not. I didn't like watching Vitality play. It's kind of. It's just average to me. I mean, I guess you have to be talking about the Cloud Nine, Cloud Nine series, or are you talking about Karavita as well? Just, just this year in general, okay. it's been pretty average. Fair enough. But I don't know. I, I like. I don't. It's not that I'm not saying they're a top team right now. It's just that just Counter Strike feels. We've had this discussion when I was doing when we you and I are in Katowice striker. Yeah, it just feels weak. Like it feels. This just feels like things are missing. Like teams are teams are missing, missing like smokes. <laughs> yeah, that in too. General. There's a lot of smokes missing. That's think, that's one thing for sure. I think you just have to th have to take that with uh, still people coming up coming to grips with CS2 and figuring out what's the what's the meta of the game because and even like the game changing like pretty much on a monthly basis still with updates and all that stuff. Like I don't think you can make a case that anybody can be consistent at the moment like hundred percent just because of of uh, not everybody knows what's gonna. Uh, what's going to be the best play um, in any situation, you know? So I think it's still going to develop over like the next year or so before people figure out CS2 and what it's about and how much the, they can exploit um, the new mechanics. Do you think that's true, Kixon? Do you think they're still working out? Like you as a player and team are still working out the best way to play CS2 at the moment? Is it still not completely ironed out? Do you think people are still discovering the best way to use like the smoke clearing and, and all these new features, like no skyboxes with you two? Or how do you feel about the game at the moment? Because that's another big question. Yeah, I think every team is kind of is proving day by day. Like every day you see something new, like new smoke or some new trick that you've never seen before. So I think it's it's definitely definitely changed a lot since uh, the release, but I think it, it can still go like much more deeper with all of these uh, tricks and the way people are playing the game. So is is that, because the thing is, the way that I was kind of framing this conversation a while ago was when CSGO first came out, I reckon the first three to four years, essentially until Astralis came in and showed everybody how to use utility properly, right? Every key piece of utility had a purpose. And then from that point on, the game's kind of been on steroids of everybody fine tuning all of those little details. And then Valve made it so you could drop the nades, which took it to an even next level, right? Now with, with CS2 being out, it felt like everybody kind of forgot that in the beginning. If you go back and you look at the type of CS2 that was being playing in Sydney, right? P people were just doing a lot more. Like people were throwing U2, don't get me wrong. 
people are running at each other a lot more, right? It's a lot more aggressive, fast-paced CS. And now it kind of feels like we're getting into a period where everybody's gone, okay, well, hold up. We can still play this game in a similar way. We just have to work out what works best. But do you think anybody's figured out how to approach CS2 the, the best yet? Is there any teams you look at and go, oh, fuck, they've got the best idea on this in the meta right now? Or do you think that's still up in the air? I think it's still up in there. I think most of the team, teams are still trying to figure out how to play the game in the best possible way. And I think, as I already said, the game is changing a lot. Like this update that was a few weeks ago with the swinging thing, mm -hmm. I think that's changed a lot. It has? Like so, noticeably, you feel it? Yeah, I think it. It there is a huge difference, I would say. And also the, the way the game works. Like for me, after that update, the game is so much smoother, for example. Okay. So for me, it, it changed a lot. So it's hard to say right now that I think most of the teams are still trying to figure out how to play the game. What about being an in-game leader and calling in MR12? Does it change any of your like decisions overall in, in as, as part of like calling? Are you going for more like gimmicks? Like what, what do you feel with MR12? Uh, I don't think it changes my way of calling that much, but uh, I can say that I'm not a big fan of having MR12 in best of ones. Okay. So I mean, I think most of the people economy are, change or you want to join, join a big club. Yeah, I don't think I'm the only one who who said this, but I think in best of three it's fine mm -hmm. because like even if you let's say you lose one map, you still have chance to come back. But in best of one, if you lose let's say both of the pistols and you lose one or two more let's say unlucky rounds, then you, like it's impossible to win the game. I feel yeah, like. I mean the game is a lot more, maybe it's stupid to say, but a lot more random in the best of ones. Like, and anyone can beat anyone. Sure. But so, do you think the economy is fine for MR12 in best of threes? Mm. Or did you want to see it changed anyway? I think it should be changed anyway. I don't know how to fix it exactly, but I think it needs a change, especially in the best of ones. So, okay. So, if the economy changed, overall would you would you be okay with best of ones or are you part of the fuck best of ones tribe <laughs> that's a good question i think still it's gonna be pretty rough to play best of ones on mr12 i think the best possible solution would be for example if we can have best of ones in mr15 and then if it's, if it's best of three it's gonna be mr12 but that's like impossible in my eyes i don't know how it's hard to do it. I mean, if it, is the economy, it is easy if, the, if it is possible, but... If the economy doesn't change, right? Like, if the economy didn't change and you did best of one as MR15 and best of three as MR12, I'm curious as that, if that would even be a consideration. But then for Valve... I mean, NETO could do that if they wanted. If they really wanted yeah. to, NETO could do it because it's like it's literally one setting in the game that you just change and that's yeah. it. Like, that's how the game works. You know, it's But easy. they won't do it because we know that everybody wants to toe the party line with what Valve do yeah, for majors, I mean, right? So, then again, like, Valve are okay with people experimenting and stuff like that. Like, I don't see why... Nobody wants would... to. Yeah, that's the point. And I mean, I understand it because like everybody, all the scene also wants to be in the same thing so that mm -hmm. they don't have to change their approaches for every tournament and all that stuff. So it's always easy. It's always hard, going to be hard to uh, um, to experiment, especially when you don't know that that's actually going to stick. You know, like let's say you do, it is something that people want, but then Valve say like, no, like we just want MR12. This is just what's in the game. You know, it's never going to happen, you know? So it's like, what's the point in the end? Like if it's not going to change for the majors, as you say, like eventually everything will default back to what they have. So that's, that's, that is the, the struggle with, with experimentation but like that. Realistically, we, aside from like online qualifiers, we shouldn't really have MR, well, like be a ones. ones. Like there's, there's really no, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. There's enough room to do like four BO3s per day now with, with MR12 and the sliding schedule, like yeah. a fairly slide, not like fully even and um we should we should be doing like blast has been doing that for a while now and especially with mr12 it works fine so i think we should just do that and uh teams and players should not should just be um i would say uh just uh, be forthcoming about the schedule sometimes not being the best for maybe the last team but overall it would be a better change for everyone instead of having beer ones that's not for that's everyone just how it, 
What? Not for the not for everyone. Not for the underdogs. That's the point. Yeah, exactly. Not everybody <laughs> wants that. Uh, but yeah. I mean, it's it's that's like one consideration. But I feel like it's the same conversation that we always had about best of ones, regardless of MR12 or 15. Just uh, I haven't like put together the data, but I do want to at some point when we have a little bit more, maybe after the major, about uh, how much MR12 is more prone to upsets versus uh, MR15 and best of ones because. Eyeballing it, it didn't feel like the RMR was that upset filled. You know, there were more like there were some series even that like were just not supposed to go the way that they went. Like look at Astralis, look at Falcons, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and some of the like a lot of the best of ones actually went pretty much exactly uh to the favorites, or at least it was like 50-50 matches or something that was reasonably close where there's just gonna be some margin of error, you know. So I feel like there aren't that many big best of one upsets, especially compared to the, like the majors past where we've seen shitloads of them, you know. Uh, so I feel like it hasn't necessarily changed. This is like my subjective feeling. I again, like I want to go through the actual data when we have a bit more best of ones because we haven't actually had a lot of them be played in like land tournaments. It's only going to be about by the end of the major that we have a a decent enough sample size to make the call. Uh, but just my my feeling is that it doesn't necessarily have that hasn't necessarily changed so much. Yeah. Uh I have a last question for Kickson. I think we're gonna end end soon, right? Yeah. Um, at least for me, last question. Is uh Don gonna be top one this year? What do you think? Mm. No. No. Okay. 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 Who's okay. gonna be number one then? Maybe Zaywolf. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, fair enough. He's probably the only I mean, other name in the conversation. It's got to be one of them, surely. <laughs> it has to be one of them, right? Yeah. Hey, who else? Well, Simple maybe, maybe back, not no. coming back. We haven't back. even talked about like Simple going to this Falcons Well, that's part of like the recent news stuff. And we're going to see him play in like 10 days time anyway. We're going to yeah. do another show before then. So we'll have, yeah, we'll have more time to be able to talk about that type of stuff. Regardless. But I don't know if you guys have seen his uh, his face and stats. They're not so great. There was a there was a, a HLTV thread. I, I saw. saw. I saw, I saw that that well. 13 average, I think, there, there was uh, in there. Uh, I think he's lost 16 games or something. Yeah, 16-5 or something like that. And his stats have been pretty rough like but in terms of individuals since think, he came back. Have yeah, you guys input lag issues? Yeah, he's got a couple of irons. <laughs> plugged in or something like that. I, I, I read the something moment. about that, that. I didn't understand where it came from, but uh, I actually had a friend that used to say the same thing all the time. He said like he has bad electricity in his house and is like has input lag in his monitor or whatever. And it was like 50% joke, 50% real. And now Simple is saying the same thing. So maybe, maybe, it's real. maybe it was real all, all along, right? That's the only thing that stopped him from going pro, I'm pretty sure. I've, I've never heard anything about it, but it could be true. It could be, it, it could be fine. All right, uh, people in chat, if you got any questions for Kixon right now, now would be a time. And also, I'm just going to quickly check because we put a little tweet out. We asked the people at home if they have any questions for Kixon. Maybe we can ask through a couple of these. Uh, Apex GG uh, on Twitter want to know how much do you miss your ex? I do sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> we all get caught in that one, mate. It's you know, it's a it's a rough one. Unlike, um, uh, unlike Apex, the player. You haven't fucked your ex in a while, so maybe maybe when you meet them the next time, you're gonna get over yeah. the, the missing part. Um, okay, here's a nice one. What are your goals slash expectations for the major? That's from Dusty Ruckus. Uh, I mean, we haven't, we still haven't talked with the team about it, but I would say maybe making the arena, the playoffs. Okay, top eight. That'd yeah. be nice. Two majors in a row. I think that's uh, a sensible, sensible goal for where you guys are at the moment. Um, I, I someone here has mentioned the Negev incident. Kicks in. <laughs> I forgot about that. Would you like to talk about the Negev purchase yeah. for everybody? Yeah, I can talk about it. I think uh, I've been using that gun for a few years already on Face It, of course, hmm. and I think it's pretty underrated. And I plan to use it a bit more often in officials as well. Okay. So just get, to clarify, get ready for it's the hate. not. I'll just say yeah. that. <laughs> No, but it's not uh, some kind of disrespect to any teams. I just think the gun is OP. Like, I'm not even kidding. It's 1.7k and you cannot get a better gun for this money. Trust me. Uh, so the thing is, like, when, when, they, when they made it this price, well, like, wasn't there basically a gentleman's agreement that players won't, wouldn't use it just because of how stupid it was? Like, was I there? think at the beginning, like, because it got, it was like the original price was something stupid, like 5k or like it was, it was a lot. I don't remember how much. I think but there it was, was something that was disallowed in some tournaments or something. I don't know about shit, disallowed, yeah. but I think like players legit like got together and was kind of like a gentleman's agreement not to use the Negev just because like Valve are stupid. Like why would they make this gun 1700 or whatever? Like it's the same level as like the SMGs, you know? 
We might have to like investigate. You can literally spam 200, 200 bullets into a smoke man. We might have to investigate that. No, I, I, I look, mate. You, you, this is the same thing with the with the agent skins at the majors. Do whatever you want, right? You can do. You can. You can you break those German yeah. agreements. It's fine. Um, or look, what if else he doesn't get? know about the gentleman's agreement, there is no gentleman's agreement. Exactly. Just say that. So. Can't be very gentlemanly. <laughs> Um, okay, somebody wants no, that's that's what whatever question. Um, do, 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 do. let me see what else have we got here. There's people asking you about types of food, like this guy wants to know ice cream or burger. Like, what type of a question is that? Or is that even a comparison? I don't know, how they're about, not even in the both? same field. Well, it's, like, both? it's like t shirts or car, yeah, they're not even, they're, they're <laughs> not even close to each other. Um, okay, here's one that 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 is could be kind of interesting because it will help uh it'll help round out some topics we missed tonight we want to keep the portuguese slash spanish people uh happy what do you think of saw and koi are they teams that are on your radar much probably more from back in the uh, apex days you would have had more run-ins with them do you do you have any strong feelings about either of those teams yeah i think i remember from the apex or even the blue jays days that those two teams were kind of annoying to play against i feel like they've always been a bit underrated They've always played this MCS. They don't have like, you know, the strongest individuals, but I think they're playing super good as a team. And that has been like for a few years already, I feel like with these teams. And I think it's, I'm happy to finally see them at the major, at a big event like this, because I think they deserve it. Yeah, well, we saw, uh, especially for the Portuguese guys, right, who had that heartbreaking loss a couple of majors ago with the whole VP thing, but we covered that one off to no end. All right, Striker Prof, you got anything else that you want to ask Kixon before we uh, shut this thing down? No, I'm going to... No, see you around. Probably. All right. Well, we're going to do another episode uh, probably, I don't know, some point later this week, maybe early next week. No, so uh, March March 5th, we have it agreed. We have a guest coming up. Did I agree? Oh, we got a yeah, guest? I think so. Oh, too. We can have you, a guest. Can you tease the guest at all? The, tea, uh, the guest is... Any clues you can give that won't give it away? What kind of... It's... You can say it's pretty cool. Yeah. Cold, right. maybe even. All right. Well, that's all right. I guess we got ROPs on the show or something. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, Kixon, is there anything that you'd like to say to the people at home, anybody watching, the, the fans, all that good stuff? Yeah, I want to thank everyone who watched uh, this show. Uh, thank uh, you guys as well for the invite. I enjoyed being here. And thanks to everyone who supports me and Heroic. Keep doing that. And yeah, see you next time. Easy. All right, man. Thank you very much for joining us on tonight's episode of HRTV Confirm. Quick shout out again to 22 Bet. Remember to gamble responsibly and trade at .gg, the sponsors of the show. We'll be back on the 5th. That's not that far away whatsoever. Actually, it is kind of far away. It's a week and a bit. We'll see what happens between now and then. Remember, you can stay up late tonight. You can watch the Asian RMRs kicking off. There's also some IEM Dallas qualifiers that are going on. You can watch Liquid and have a bit of a heart attack. And then uh, coming on in about, what, fucking... Uh, just over a week, five, six days or whatever it is. The America's RMR is stunning as well from Monterey, Mexico. So we'll have all the teams locked in for the major and then the major will be just around the corner. So good night, everybody. Peace. Esports Odds. VIP program and a variety of bonuses. Fast and easy withdrawals. Bet on every possible CSGO matching tournament. As well as any other esports game. Only on 22Bet. Are you tired of your boring old skins? Head to Trade It and trade them for exciting new ones within seconds. With 24-7 support, massive inventory, free giveaways, and low fees, Trade It is the highest rated trading platform in the market. What are you waiting for? Start trading today for a $5 bonus, only on Trade It.